So uh, the first um, cases will be um, child through birth, um, child age birth through five. Uh, then case, the second set will be school age children. Uh, the third set will be older teens, young adults. And this, the fourth case will be older adults home setting. And I'm Ellen Cohn from University of Pittsburgh. And my job here is to just not get in the way of these wonderful presenters and keep us on time. Okay, so we will start out with case, the um, segment for case one. Um, Andy Stewart, Andrew officially, um, he's got a PhD. He's uh, seed um, certified in audiology. Uh, he's professor, Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders in East Carolina Universities. He's really like one of the few teleaudiologists in the country, so we're really happy to have him here. And that will be followed by Angela uh, Chicha, who is an associate professor, Department of Psychological Services, Communication Sciences Program, Case Western Reserve University. And the two of them will be um, working again with the, um, the younger child, and they'll be sharing a case study. So um, Andy, we're going to let you move up here. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. Um, happy to be here. And uh, uh, Angela and I are going to uh, walk you through a, a case of a hearing impaired uh, uh, child. Uh, I am the only audiologist in the in the room, so I'm going to give a little bit of background in terms of uh, what uh, we're concerned about in terms of identifying these kids and uh, what we need to do early on. Um, and how uh, this case is developed is actually a patient that uh, I saw in uh, Eastern uh, North Carolina, and Angela will pick it up kind of where I where I kind of drop off uh, in terms of what I do in terms of my diagnostics. Um, so we will g give you a little bit of a background um, and then walk you through why we're doing what we're doing and then the services that we're um, providing. Um, this is the uh, obligatory disclosure um, because the project that I was on is uh, sponsored by HRSA. Uh, any, the most important thing they want me to say is uh, the information, content and conclusions are those of mine not Angela's or anyone else's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Angela and I are salaried uh, professors uh, at, at our respective uh, institutions, and the travel accommodations and registrations were provided um, by the conference, and thank you very much for that. And we have no uh, non-financial uh, relationships. Um, so just a little bit of background in terms of uh, why um, we're interested in identifying uh, uh, hearing loss at a, ver at a very early age. Um, we know, we've known for, for some time that um, if you have a significant hearing loss, then that's going to impair your ability to perceive speech. And when that happens, there's just a cascade of things that occur. Uh, if your speech perception is impaired, uh, you will not develop expressive and receptive language like a normal hearing child uh, will. Um, your academic achievement will suffer. And then there's a number of social and emotional uh, aspects that uh, are laid on top of those things for a young infant. Uh, if you uh, do not treat hearing loss uh, and uh, you grow up uh, without hearing, then there are further effects in terms of loss of income across the lifespan, uh, cost of education uh, if the child is not mainstreamed. And then there's a tremendous cost to the family uh, in terms of time and things like that. And, emotional and social burdens. So uh, it's important to identify hearing loss and do something about it. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about newborn hearing screening. Um, back in the 70s and 80s, the uh, uh, need to identify uh, children with hearing loss was recognized. And at the time, uh, infants that were screened for hearing loss were those that were, that were identified as being at risk. Uh, and some of the risk factors were if there was an affected family member, if there was a birth defect of ear, head, neck, or throat, uh, if there was a maternal uh, infection, things like that. Those infants were identified in the birthing facility and those infants were tested and the other infants were kind of let, uh, uh, you know, go out the door. In the 1980s, it was uh, becoming aware that of all the infants that were born with congenital hearing loss, only half of them were at risk, okay? They had an identified at risk factor. And then half the infants, uh, you know, were just, you know, uh, uh, were born with a hearing loss. So in the 90s, um, there were a number of uh, consensus statements that were coming out 
identifying the need for universal newborn hearing screening. In other words, all infants should be screened at birth. Uh, and so in the 90s, uh, a number of states started to adopt uh, this procedure and legislate it. Uh, in the U.S. right now, uh, not every state has mandated uh, legislation, but probably 90 percent of them do. So, uh, in North Carolina, uh, this uh, legislation was introduced in 2000, and early hearing detection and intervention began. Uh, and early on, the success was very good in terms of uh, testing infants at birth. Uh, so in 2006, about 98% of all infants born were screened at birth. Those numbers today are running at about 99 plus percent. We're very good at, at at least screening the kids. The big problem uh, is that those infants that are referred from a newborn hearing screening are not being seen for diagnostic follow-up. So in 2006, about half the infants were lost to follow-up or lost to documentation. We, just don't know, you know, what happened. Uh, and eventually what happened with these kids, they'll show up in a preschool screening, hearing screening, and they're three, four, five years old, and they're significantly delayed in terms of speech and language development, and that's a problem, and they're uh, behind pretty much for the rest of their lives. Um, so the question is uh, that we were asking, can teleaudiology or telemedicine help? And so, of course, we have a patient with need, uh, and we have audiologists with services. And um, if we can get those together in a telemedicine, uh, telehealth uh, uh, environment, then maybe we can reduce the number that are lost uh, to diagnosis. Um, this is actually an earlier slide. Uh, in our practice, uh, or in our profession, telepractice is a term that we use for a provision of speech language uh, services in audiology. Teleaudiology is a term that we use in audiology. Uh, it was actually coined at East Carolina University by my colleague, um, Greg Gibbons. So um, the scenario here for our case is Eastern North Carolina, and that circle represents uh, kind of where, um, uh, uh, where I'm talking about. Uh, I'm located right there. Um, there's about 30, 35 counties in uh, eastern North Carolina. And the catchment area, uh, like a lot of rural uh, areas in the US, um, there's a high percentage below the poverty level. Um, there's a high uh, teen pregnancy rate. There's a, quite a distance uh, for uh, children and parents to travel um, to get to diagnostic sites and they're not easily accessible. It should be a clicker question. What's the crop on the top? <laughs> Tobacco, cotton. Uh, and the, the ferry represents a, a, a marine travel out around the Outer Banks. It's very difficult to get off the Outer Banks into the mainland, and it takes uh, a couple hours just uh, to get ferries uh, and whatnot. So uh, back in 2009, the Department of Health and Human Services that uh, houses the early identification uh, hearing program uh, received some money from HRSA to uh, uh, look into this loss to follow up program. And a portion of that money went to this teleaudiology pro uh, um, program that I was uh, involved in. And it, the idea was to provide diagnostic evaluations for children in Eastern North Carolina. So the players in that, um, be uh, the beginning of the project, as I said, was the Department of Health and Human Services and then East Carolina University. Now, um, we we're kind of special in that obviously we were, uh, we were located in the East, but we have a, an established telemedicine center that's been going since the early 90s. It's one of the earliest telemedicine programs in the United States, if not the world, very well established. And the department that I work in, uh, we had the expertise for uh, diagnostics. So that's how I became involved in this. So the project goals were to provide diagnostic services in this rural, um, uh, in these rural counties. And the kind of the things that we were driving was to, uh, to try to cut down travel time for parents and infants, increase the number of children diagnosed by three months, and then uh, lower that number who are lost uh, to follow up. And these objectives were uh, in tune with the Joint Committee on Infant um, 
hearing uh, their 136 plan. Now, the 136 plan is simply um, we want all infants screened by one month of age, all infants who are referred from screening to be uh, to receive diagnostic testing by three months of age, and any of those that are diagnosed with hearing loss that need some habilitation be seen and fit with uh, hearing aids and devices by six months of age. Those are the, the um, kind of time uh, frames that we're working with and we're trying to um, uh, get the kids seen by. If we can do this, there's plenty of uh, research that says that infants that are fit and attended to by six months of age, um, their language, their speech and language develops pretty much uh, in line with those kids that are normal hearing. Angela will talk about that, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> how she does it. Um, so uh, one of the things that we did have in place was uh, a number of remote uh, telemedicine sites. So the Brody School of Medicine at ECU is located here. And then around the eastern uh, counties are a number of telemedicine sites. They're basically uh, sites in rural uh, hospital settings, rural health clinics, um, where kids and parents can come in and be seen. Um, and ECU uh, offers a number of services uh, besides uh, what we were doing. So, I'll introduce you to um, this, uh, our case, JJ. Um, JJ was uh, a 26 uh, uh, week, or it was born at 26 weeks gestation, uh, basically two months premature, uh, a young male. Um, he was uh, obviously at risk for low birth weight because of such an uh, early gestational age. Uh, and he spent about two and a half months in the neonatal intensive care unit before he was discharged. Okay. Um, and another uh, kind of significant thing uh, for this family was JJ's mom was the sole provider uh, in this uh, uh, particular uh, family. Uh, so not very, uh, this is kind of common. The one thing that's a little bit uncommon uh, relative to the rest of the case I see is the fact that he was born really, um, really early. So, um, what did, or what happened uh, in terms of his hearing assessments? Well, he was uh, given a hearing screening just prior to discharge. Uh, he was 76 days old at that time, so he's basically at term when he's discharged. Um, and he received what was called an aut automated auditory brainstem response. And that's a hearing screening where we put electrodes on the head and measure the brain's response to sounds that we put in the baby's ears. Um, so he was referred bilaterally. Uh, he was rescreened at 91 days uh, with the same uh, uh, outcome, uh, refer for diagnostic testing. So um, what were some of the barriers to service that JJ, I have will experience, he did experience, or would experience. Um, so there were no diagnostic uh, services at the birthing center, which is quite common. We have about 98 birthing centers in North Carolina, and diagnostic audiology services are probably at less than half a dozen, if that. Um, as I said, single mom with limited resources. Uh, he uh, resides uh, about three hours from where I'm located, uh, about three hours the other way to the nearest diagnostic, so quite a ways um, from available diagnostic sites. Solution, 30 minute drive to one of our telemedicine sites, and uh, so the, the players uh, that were involved in terms of identifying and making the appointments were made, and he uh, eventually uh, came to see me. Uh, a little bit about what we do, um, that's me in the, the telemedicine site at Brody. Um, we have synchronous services to clients with uh, real-time data collection, uh, and I'll show you a little bit more on that. And then we have uh, asynchronous store forward of audiometric data that's uh, more difficult for me to interpret if it's not normal and I have to take the results and uh, spend a little more time than, than my uh, allotted appointment time uh, for the infant. So this is uh, kind of what happens. Um, that's me, obviously. Um, so the appointments are made, the, the, uh, the, the parent or parents come in. Um, I have a, a technician working with me. 
that's on site, um, who actually is my hands, um, and uh, so you can see the person on the right. So uh, we introduce, hello, uh, this is what's going to happen. Um, uh, it takes time to prep the infant. Um, I kind of step back, uh, uh, let my hands uh, on site uh, get the baby ready. Um, it takes a little bit of time because I have to test these kids in natural, uh, in natural sleep. They can't be moving. Uh, they have to be very quiet. Um, and so we get them ready and then calm them down, lights out and things like that. Uh, and then um, uh, what I do after the test starts, depending on the site, I'm uh, connected to a computer where I can see uh, ongoing data collection uh, uh, for, uh, for me. Um, and, and or I have a control of a camera that zooms in and looks at the screen depending on the site that we're at. Uh, at the end, uh, we uh, cancel the, the parent and or, and or parents about what I found or if I need more time, I get back to them uh, later that day after I get the data pushed to me. If it's a case of normal find, it's very easy. Uh, it's a lot easier to interpret. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, talking and planning in terms of what goes on um, or what's needed to go on. So what happened with... Um, JJ, uh, I basically do three tests. One is a, a test of middle ear function that tells us if there's any fluid or ear infections going on. Uh, Otoacoustic emissions is a test of hear the hearing organ sensitivity. And then the uh, auditory brainstem response is a brainwave activity. Um, and I try and do all of these on all the kids. In the case of JJ, the middle ear function was normal, um, which tells me there's no fluid there. I don't have to worry about that and refer for that. His uh, uh, inner ear test was abnormal and his ABR test was abnormal. In the ABR test, the brainstem response, I use that to estimate a behavioral audiogram, what the hearing sensitivity is as if the child was old enough to raise their hand. Um, and from that, I uh, diagnosed him with a severe to profound uh, sensory hearing loss, uh, which is a very significant amount of loss, uh, very devastating uh, to the parent. Um, and the good news for me is we've identified this infant very early and let's, let's move. So um, now he was four and a half months chronological age. His corrected age is about two and a half, okay? Uh, I'll just put this uh, slide up here. This is data from our test, just as box plots of the kids in the particular um, study that was published a couple of years ago or last year. Um, Here's our uh, a screening, rescreen, and diagnostics. The uh, bars in the middle of the, the plots are median uh, times. And if you look at that goal I said of 136, we want our kids screened by one month. Uh, and actually, we did a very uh, good job of that. We have a couple of outliers here. Those are the kids like JJ that are, that's his uh, chronological age. He spent two and a half months in the NICU. We don't test them until they're well enough to go home. So. Um, that's not unusual. The diagnostics, um, uh, I'm doing my job. We can get it done. We have one outlier, uh, even past JJ. Those are very sick kids that uh, are delayed from hospital uh, discharge and then kind of are lagged, and most of them are, are preemies. So if we actually corrected for um, uh, or put in the corrected age, all of our kids are seen by three months. Uh, so. Um, our model works. That's just to show you real quickly. Um, so the recommendation for JJ was amplification, hearing aids bilaterally, um, but we still have some issues with him. There's no rehabilitation services at the birthing center or the health clinic he's at. Um, and, and again, the mom is a sole provider with limited resources. Uh, and again, he's three hours from now not only diagnostic sites, but sites that provide amplification and follow-up. Um, he was fit. Uh, so within two weeks when I saw him, he was fit with hearing aids. So that's really, really good. Uh, nine months later, he, he was uh, considered for cochlear implants. Uh, that's what it looks like on the side. And then he did receive implants at two years of age. Basically, kids that don't benefit from hearing aids and don't progress with speech and language um, are considered candidates for cochlear implants, and he was. 
and things to do um, as part of his audiometric follow-up. Uh, we continue to test hearing aid adjustments, cochlear implant programming, et cetera. And although uh, not involved with JJ, um, we have teleaudiology models to demonstrate that hearing aid fitting and programming, a cochlear implant fitting and programming can be done the same way uh, in a telemedicine environment. Uh, so uh, it is available, although I'm not doing that part of it. I want to thank, thank Andrew. That was one, a wonderful presentation. Now we have um, Angela Chicha, who is Associate Professor, Department of Psychological Services, Communication Sciences Program, one of my people, um, at Case Western Reserve University. And she'll continue with the same case for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have about five or 10 minutes for questions. OK. So just before we go into the case, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself and what we do with telehealth. Um, rather than addressing rural children's needs, um, my specialty is um, urban, lower income minority children. Um, and you know, we, being in a large city, there's major medical centers rather close geographically, but there's still many, many barriers to families coming in for service. And our inner city low income families had a high no-show rate. Um, and we're really missing critical windows for development. It should also be noted that um, poverty, kids living in poverty generally are diagnosed with a developmental condition several years later than their middle and upper SES counterparts. And so oftentimes these children's developmental needs are not identified until kindergarten or first grade Whereas for middle and upper SES children, these would be identified by three. So there's quite a discrepancy. Um, and what we strive to do is to uh, go into uh, walkable neighborhood health clinics that are located within the inner city um, and provide developmental monitoring um, and support to the clinic where um, these community clinics are often putting out fires, so to speak, um, and um, the developmental milestones may not be the top priority. Um, there may not be time to monitor them within a traditional physician office visit. So that's really where our work comes from. So I just want to give you that background uh, about the work that we've been doing. Um, and so what we specialize in is using um, both web-based questionnaires uh, that get automatic screening and coordinated input into the child's electronic medical record so that during the same visit, the physician can talk with them um, about their child's development during um, the appointment. Um, and this can be done while they're waiting in the waiting room or while they're waiting in the pediatrician's office for the nurse to come in and do immunizations or while they're waiting for the pediatrician to come in. And then we also have um, one day a week a full developmental screening that takes about 25 minutes that's done via telehealth. Um, and then those results also get passed directly to the pediatrician and the family is provided real-time referral um, during that same um, session. So essentially they just walk down the hall and come on in for their developmental screening. So it's, it's actually more than a screening, but not quite a several hour assessment. So 30 minutes um, and they get cognition via play, um, feeding and nutrition, um, language, speech, um, and play. So we cover most of the areas. We don't have a physical therapist right now, so we're not doing motor, um, OTPT, we look for some um, small motor goals that are on general developmental screenings, but if anything large appears, we certainly um, do make the referral. So in terms of um, someone like JJ, what we're really talking about is habilitative services, supporting normal speech, language, and cognitive development um, from as early as possible. So even before all hearing issues are, are handled via cochlear implant and ongoing assessment, we can still work with the parents or whoever's providing care 
So we frequently have families where the children are not with the parents. So they're with it within the foster system, some other guardian or care provider. And so training that family to uh, provide a stimulating language and cognitive environment so that when the child does have hearing restored to the best possible level, they hit the ground running and are able to catch up um, in a quicker fashion. So a lot of what we focus on very early on, clearly when we're talking about little ones, we're not doing one-to-one -one direct intervention. We're doing parent or caregiver training, doing some modeling about how to stimulate language, cognitive and play skills, um, and, and providing some counseling as it relates to um, developmental concerns and milestones. And then we also have a chance to observe the caregiver interacting with the child and provide cues and strategies. And then also as the child gets a little bit older and is a little bit more independent, um, doing dynamic assessment to see how they're doing with their developmental um, trajectories um, and then still having that one-to-one -one parent interaction for guidance um, and direction. So in terms of um, a child like JJ, uh, when we're talking about providing speech language and cognitive services, we're talking about using um, a family-centered early intervention approach that's very well accepted, um, that should be culturally and linguistically responsive. Um, and so by being in, in our case, in the child's neighborhood and appreciating all family structures that that might come with, we're able to directly interact with whoever is going to be the primary provider, whether it be an older sibling, a parent, as I said, a caregiver, a foster provider, um, whoever. Um, and that you're there to support developmental milestones, developmental trajectories, and that you're doing this in a natural environment. And so for many of our families, if they, if they don't have internet capability in their home, as I said, we're in walkable neighborhood clinics. And so they can come into the clinic um, go to the telehealth station that's within the pediatric practice and um, we're there to answer questions um, on the days that we're located in the in the facility. So it, it's never by appointment, it's always walk-in service and so um, even though we're primarily diagnostic, we're there, we can still answer questions. Um, you know, people don't show for their appointments when the, for the PG, so there's always gaps in the day, right? So there's, people can come in and usually they just have a quick question. Um, this also allows for comprehensive coordinated team-based services. And so in a transdisciplinary model in early intervention, you have one provider that's trained to see developmental uh, milestones and support developmental progress in all areas. Um, and so using uh, telehealth, you can interface with the physician, make sure the information is being entered into the medical record and still being in the child's uh, natural environment. As I said, if it can't be the home, at least it's in a clinic within their neighborhood community. Um, so our developmental monitoring is much like many developmental screenings. Uh, this is a touchscreen based developmental screener um, written at the fourth grade level. We've actually found that for many of our families, this is a, a challenge that it's written at the fourth grade level. So we're currently in the process of changing it to a pictorial majority um, screening so that there's very little, very few words. This serves two purposes. One for our families that have literacy concerns, but also for our families that English is not the first language and um, we don't have all these uh, tools translated. And so by using a pictorial demonstration of the developmental milestone and something like a smiley face or a sad face um, to answer the prompt, you can get more accurate responses. So when we first started, um, we had about a 40% abandon rate for using the developmental screening. And from our, we have a graduate student who's there um, supporting the project. Um, and just through their observations, they would say, you know, they were asking us vocabulary, what does this mean? And then after they had to ask maybe twice, they would I, become more self-conscious and just stop. Um, and so we're, we're really working to modify this and address this. And it's really not something that's addressed on typical developmental screeners that are web-based at this point in time. 
From there, as I said, then we could move to a typical, uh, what would be considered a typical telerehabilitation synchronous model. We are using all touchscreen um, equipment. We also found that families did not know how to use a mouse, a computer mouse. Um, we just couldn't do it. And so we had to move everything to a touchscreen system. Families are able to um, use their own device if they have one. We can get them into the Wi-Fi in the community clinic if they feel more comfortable using their personal device. But we also have equipment there that they can use if they would like to choose that. So these are just some details, as I said, of, of what we do in terms of monitoring. So the, the developmental assessment um, can be done during every visit. And so that's not just a one-off. So anytime the child is coming in, whether it be for a sick visit or a well visit, they can complete um, the developmental monitoring piece. And then as needed, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics rep, um, re, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, what's the word? Recommends, thank you. I was gonna say requires, but that wasn't it. Um, at least screenings at 18 and 24 months. Um, and actually, so the, the actual implementation of that in low-income groups is very low. And so by having us there, um, every child and family that has a few extra minutes to stop by is welcome to stop by. And as I said, this gets completed and put into their, to their medical record. Uh, this is our risk. We call this a risk assessment. And so roughly for these kids, we're getting a 30%. Um, identification of risk. This is purposely over identifying children because of the discrepancy in age identification. We'd rather get the child on somebody's radar than have them slip through and not be getting any services until kindergarten. Um, so and then you can watch their risk over time. Um, and then on the screening, uh, this is a little more tight in terms of sensitivity and specificity, as we would imagine. We get to about 10 to 15 percent, which is the population norm that you would expect. So we feel comfortable that using the telehealth approach, we're not over or under identifying uh, potential developmental concerns. So um, our group does not specialize in intervention, but rather getting kids identified and um, tapped into services that are available, as I said, within the community where they live where possible, um, or within a telepractice site um, in their region if, if you're talking about a more rural um, patient group. Um, for someone like JJ, the intervention focus post-cochlear implant will be on auditory training, um, specializing in having the child hear and identify uh, sounds, environmental and language-based speech sounds that would be appropriate for developmental levels, continue to encourage normal speech language and cognitive development, and continue to um, engage with the child and family over time. As I said, a large focus is on parent training. Um, many families are very comfortable now uh, working in video conferencing, you know, even if you're talking about FaceTime. They feel very comfortable talking um, over Wi-Fi about what their concerns are um, and providing models. They're able to show us, you know, within the home, you know, what types of toys they have, uh, materials, you know, what does the environment look like, and they can be given um, cues and suggestions for way to continue to model and approach the child's development. And everything is done via play, right? So play is the commodity of childhood, so we're, we're trying to really um, encourage that as much as we can. And so this feels much more natural than a medical appointment might. The, really the idea for someone like JJ is to make sure they're ready for preschool, as for all the kids that we see, um, is that they have the speech, language, and cognitive skills to be successful in preschool. Um, and unfortunately, there's been a very high expulsion rate of preschool children. This is, believe it or not, an actual problem, um, as much as you don't want to hear that. Um, and so making sure that, that children have the necessary ways to communicate their needs is really important by preschool, so that they're not pigeonholed um, is problematic. And we know for many low-income children that come from environments that are a little bit more challenging, 
when this happens, um, they tend to get a sort of a bad label rather than looking for what they need. And so really what we're trying to do is get the kids as much communication as we can so that they can make their needs known or their frustrations known, their emotions known, so that they are ready for preschool um, and they're ready to learn, um, achieve, and grow in a safe um, environment. Uh, it's always bothered me why, why we lose uh, these kids or why they don't follow up. Um, and I think it's part of our profession. One of the things, we did a study a couple years ago uh, where we had kids in Head Start, where we went in and did hearing screening, we did PT screening, uh, we did dental screening, we did a number of screenings across uh, kids that, uh, you know, were three, four. For the kids that were referred for diagnostic hearing screening, only about half of them got diagnostic services. And I thought it was kind of a, a rural poverty education thing. Well, when I looked at the numbers for vision screening and referred, the follow-up for vision was over 95%. And, um, um, you know, it just blew me away. And the thing that bothers me is parents value some things more than other things. And so in our field of speech, and it's, well, I say audiology, uh, speak for the speech people, we don't do a very good job in terms of the importance of hearing, um, where something, you know, vision is recognized, but hearing isn't. And, and if hearing's not attended to, speech and language issues arise and et cetera. So it's, it's just an interesting thing in terms of, of what parents, um, you know, value and why we're losing them. Thank you. Sounds like we should get together with the vision testing folks. Do it at one time. Um, I just wanted to follow up that and say, you know, for our families, when we talk to them, they say, well, you know, I have these other children or I'm caring for these other children and I don't have paid days off work and I can't take three buses, even though this is still within the same neighborhood. Um, to do that with four kids and not miss my appointment window is almost next to impossible. So when we talk to them about, you know, maybe why they might not have followed up with any recommendations from the hospital or any recommendations um, that came even from within the family clinic, it just wasn't feasible. Or if they did get an appointment, they had a six-month wait list. And, you know, things change in six months. They had a different address maybe if they're in the foster system, their caregiver situation has changed. And so that's a really a huge barrier for these families that are really juggling a lot. And so they would say, you know, if they, you have something close that I don't have to wait six months for, that I can come in and I know somebody's there and can answer even if it's just in 10 minutes that I also I'm not waiting three hours to get in, um, just really made a huge difference. So we had many kids that had the parents had been told that there was concern, but there just wasn't a way that they felt was feasible to address it. Thank you. Um, we're gonna move ahead now. We're graduating. To, well, you'll have a chance to talk to people also. Um, great questions and responses. So we'll, um, Lauren's going first, right? Okay, so um, we're graduating to school age. This is exciting. And we have um, Lauren Little, who um, has a PhD, and she's an occupational therapist. She's assistant professor, Department of Occupational Therapy at Rush University. And I'll introduce David now. Um, David Cattell Gordon, a Master's of Divinity, a Master's in Social Work, um, Director of Office of Telemedicine, uh, the Karen Rubain Center for Telehealth and Senior Advisory, Health Appalachia Institute, University of Virginia. That's a lot of titles. After your name. You're, doing, you're doing too much work. Okay, Lauren, go for it. So we're going to be talking about using the needs, uh, using telehealth to meet the needs of military families of children with autism. A couple of learning objectives, uh, an increased understanding of characteristics of autism, 
a basic understanding of effective approaches to treatment, including ABA, um, a better understanding of the use of telehealth to meet uh, the needs of families of children with autism, specifically looking at how autism uh, impacts military families in a slightly different way uh, than other families. And then we're interweaving um, a best case presentation of um, a child with autism throughout this presentation. And so we're gonna go back and forth um, and David's gonna take a 30,000 foot view, kind of the big picture, and then we're gonna zoom back and forth talking about a little girl named Cora. Um, this is really near and dear to my heart. Uh, I provide OT services for children with autism uh, using telehealth and many of our uh, families are military families. So this was a, a perfect title for us. Let's talk about Cora. Uh, Cora is six years old. She loves pink. She loves pancakes. She loves jumping and going to the park, much like other six-year-olds. And she has a diagnosis of autism. Uh, she was diagnosed at age three. She's now uh, six. So let's keep Cora in mind as we go on. So also wear another hat. Um, and this is my only conflict of interest. That's Daniel. Daniel's my son uh, with autism. He is now 26 years old. Um, and I am a co-founder and former executive director of the Virginia Institute of Autism, which is a um, ABA school, day school for kids with autism in Charlottesville, Virginia. We have 50 students uh, in the day school. We have 20 adults in the adult program and reach about 1,500 people through outpatient behavioral services. Um, so it's important to start with that. So you know that that's where I come from, but that's what's powerful about this for me. Um, Cora is wonderful too. Dan doesn't have a particular color choice. Um, <laughs> so he, quick poll, who here knows someone with autism or a family with someone with autism? If I'd come in this room 20 years ago, that would not have been the response, right? Things have changed. Um, and the spectrum that we are dealing with in terms of what autism is, is, is confounding. When you don't know true etiology and you're throwing darts all the time to understand it and people watch TV and they see, what's the name of the show? Good Doctors, a new show with a kid with autism. Yeah, I, I work at a health system. I know people with, uh, on the spectrum who are physicians and research scientists, and, but I also know kids, adults, who flap their hands and are nonverbal. And so it's hard to peg this down to one specific thing, but we'll do the best we can. Um, so the diagnosis located in the DSM, uh, given the response, most of you know this. Really the way to think about this and what we deal with in terms of a team and rehab and how we think about treatment, it's always in terms of excesses and deficits. Excesses in behavior and the, the vocalizations and the flapping hands and peculiarities and then that social isolation. Uh, I love that picture because the term, what does autism mean? Who, who knows what the word means? It's from the Greek auto, meaning aloneness. It's isolation, it's a, it's a separation from the world, and so telehealth and the tools of breaking through um, isolated environments for families and kids is critical. Uh, we used to call it a lot of things. Um, I came home from Daniel's diagnosis and my, and my mother, I, she said, what is it? And I said, well, he's got pervasive developmental disorder. She said, thank God, I thought he had autism. Um, so we've come, a, a little ways to see it as spectrum disorder, but we still got a long way to go and someday we'll know more about that. Um, so there are those two ends of the spectrum as you guys, especially you guys who work in developmental issues, know those kids with classic autism can are identified with the more severe, isolated sort of uh, expressions and those like the good doctor or the kid that they just signed for, for, to play baseball this week, professional baseball with autism, so it runs that spectrum. But at the core, they're communication disorders, right? And that's our work. Um, there are a lot of factors. Uh, there are always a lot of discussion about what the etiology is, so it's important to talk about what it is not. Uh, anybody you get the bonus point, get the chocolate, if you know who that person up there is? Bruno Bettelheim, 
Orthogenic Institute of Chicago. He said the cause of autism was refrigerator mothers. We need to know this. There's a moral component to what we're talking about here. He would take the children in the therapy, move the children into treatment, and then he would have the parents, the mothers in particular, go into showers and scrub off their vile nature. This was in the 1950s. But this is still present, and Laura and I were talking, it's both present in our work, so it's very important in making decisions for how we care to think about what it is not. It is not parenting. Um, here's the big context setter for Cora. Look at the crowd she's in. Um, that's why 20 years ago, when it was two in 500, here we are, and it's one in 68, one in 66 is now quoted. These are CDC numbers. It is greater than childhood cancer, juvenile diabetes, and pediatric AIDS combined. It is that present. Is it improved diagnosis? We don't know. Is it, is it just a more common incidence? Um, most recent data suggests that that's true, but there are 101.5 million, and they cross the barriers from the settings that you talked about, Angela, and the settings you talked about, Andrew, they are the same. So we've got to deal with that. It is increasing 10 to 17% annually. Think about what we are facing in there and what this tsunami is. So, um, you know, the challenges, obviously, um, whether it's disrupted sleep patterns or isolation or um, family isolation, depression, high rates of anxiety, abuse, bullying, um, being lost to the system, it, it's huge. One of those subsets that we want to talk about today, because we have a very a significant need in the military families. Uh, just the, the rate of autism occurs at the same level. Um, and these families face some very particular challenges as military families for how they're going to deal with. And I just wanted to say a few things about um, our process with Fort Lee. Fort Lee is the quartermaster's base in Petersburg, Virginia. Um, it has been really critical, obviously, with the engagements in Afghanistan and Iraq. It is growing exponentially, uh, the, the resources that are needed from Fort Lee. And two years ago, Fort Lee had to suspend taking in any more families that had children with autism because on this base there were already 240 children identified who were all going out to the Prince George school system um, that had no idea how to deal with children with autism. Um, the whole system was overwhelmed, so it clogged up the quartermaster's process in the U.S. Army because there were so many kids with autism. And so David talked about how autism um, impacts families and family routines. So in addition to the core uh, symptoms of autism, that social communication issues, the restricted and repetitive behaviors, um, a lot of times there's problems with the daily routines. So transitions to and from locations. Um, I work with lots of parents who it's just the transition to school in the morning, transition home. Um, uh, everyday activities such as sleeping, eating. These are huge challenges for families, um, which often uh, make families set up very strict routines to meet their children's needs. So we eat at five o'clock because after school we drive to Chick-fil-A and only get the one chicken nuggets and the one fries that he likes, and we have to eat by 515 because if not, our entire evening is done. And so when you take that kind of routinization among families and then throw in um, how military families, kind of the challenges that they face um, with all of the um, deployments, um, mom or dad being gone, these changes in routine on top of such um, a demanding uh, routine for a child with autism, you can imagine that, that extra layer of challenge. So um, we, we just named a couple of these here. Another, uh, one of the things in addition to that, that high routinization is thinking about how 
the frequent moves associated with deployments, um, et cetera, are associated with access to care. Um, and the story of Fort Lee did, um, exemplifies that. Um, or fighting across different school systems. The last school system I was in, my child had OT and PT two times a week, and this time you're telling me it's 15 minutes? You know, what, what is this about? So um, that just adds a, another layer. And so this really creates an opportunity for telehealth to meet the needs of these families. Um, we, can, we can think about this as continuity of care throughout relocations. So even as a support for a family trying to navigate um, some of these uh, local school systems, um, supporting uh, oftentimes uh, the mother in these cases if her spouse is deployed um, because I, as you were talking about driving to appointments, um, she can't throw all four kids in the car and drive to these appointments, and isn't it so nice to have that in the house? And I think you were going to talk yeah. about Yeah, and the, um, I, I wanted to say a couple of things about then how this applies, obviously, to, to telehealth and the application of telehealth in these settings, given how bound things are to routine. Um, and how critical, um, I, I love the description of the natural environment, how critical that environment is for whether or not you're adjusting that cochlear implant or whether or not you're, you're doing speech and language um, for, for all the disciplines, ABA or OT, the need is to be able to support that routine schedules uh, to really have a full cadre of people understanding those processes that really work uh, in autism and telemedicine becomes a critical tool both for training, team connectivity, as well as reaching into the home or the continuity of care across locations. Um, and there are obviously there are obviously resources for military family, and we've been talking a lot about them. Um, and there's that word TRICARE up there. TRICARE covers uh, applied behavioral analysis and services for kids with autism if you can get reimbursed for TRICARE for those services. It is a battle. Uh, it is a continual battle. The sad thing about Fort Lee was, in providing those services, they had to be discontinued because TRICARE could not, did not recognize providing it, even though it is in the language uh, of TRICARE. So um, you, you look out across the 50 states as a footnote to that, um, and there is no consistent model for reimbursement for care for autism, um, and so much less providing services through telemedicine into the home. It's sadly lacking. Families are identified in the military um, to go into the EMFP programs, but they are overwhelmed. Those exceptional military family programs are, are have to deal with everything. Uh, the aunt with Alzheimer's disease that's with the family, the child with autism, the disability from a spouse who had been actively deployed, um, all fall into that and they can't respond. The military and OAR has, has set up an Operation Autism site, but it is very difficult for that family who's scheduling to go to Chick-fil-A or in my case, canes now, chicken and fries being fundamental, um, that, that it is very, very hard to know how to do scheduling from looking at a resource on a website. And so we just heard about early intervention, and I wanted to lead us into thinking about school age uh, from here, because many of the families um, that I currently work with are aging out of early intervention um, into preschool, kindergarten, school-based services. The difficulty, however, is they lose, they oftentimes lose home-based services um, to get their school-based services. However, school base has to be educationally relevant. And so um, telehealth has allowed for many of these families to still receive intervention in their authentic context, still focused on those home routines. 
A little more about Cora. Um, she's in an inclusive kindergarten classroom with a para for some of her day, but spends most of her time in a self-contained classroom. Her dad is currently deployed. And um, when we work with parents um, in, the, in the telehealth study that I run, we allow parents to identify their own goals. Um, so these were Cora's goals that her mother identified, morning routine and transition to school, bowel movement training, and then the bathing routine. And the reason I wanted to focus on the bathing routine for this session is to give you all an idea about how telehealth can allow us to work with a parent to think about the context of the home. Because oftentimes those clinic-based services, I don't, I don't really know how we would work on bathing completely in a clinic-based service. We can, we can start to, um, but it doesn't truly get at the bathroom that Cora has at home, the experience of bathing. Um, and if you have a child who uh, will not bathe or it's a screaming match, um, that's a routine you, you want to work on and you want some help with. So uh, we touched on this in the last presentation and I loved it so much. Um, Family-centered care is providing intervention that's based on the family's priorities and the family's goals. Um, the research shows that mothers of children with autism uh, have stress levels uh, that are similar to that of um, veterans. And then we talk about mothers of children with autism in, with have uh, spouses in the military, the stress on top of that. And so this layer of stress for these particular parents is incredibly high. Um, and again and again, studies show that family-centered care can not only improve the outcomes for the child, but can reduce parent stress. So um, all professionals must collaborate to support the family. Um, so when you have an unknown etiology, it's a neurologic condition, um, it appears genetic in its, in its base, but um, we have a lot of different research going on and are still not pegged to our understanding of that. Um, how do you proceed? Um, and um, the only recommended treatment at this point in time at its base from, from the Center for Disease Control is applied behavior analysis, um, which is simply, who, who can give me a definition of applied behavior analysis? It's applied, looking at the kid there, it's looking at their behavior and analyzing it as you go in a, a process of reinforcing the behavior that you wanna see. And I think as Lauren was describing, it's children who are um, what they love to call in the field neurotypicals um, learn by observation. Um, and so you see somebody doing something, monkey see, monkey do. Um, within autism spectrum, you have to teach every one of those skills. You have to teach um, shoe tying and bathroom skills and bathing skills. Uh, so being in that natural environment um, is a critical element to what we do. And in that setting, the coordination of a team um, both th using telemedicine through for training purposes as well as using the tool itself to get into the natural environment to support the family is critical. Um, and I, I think the reason, of course, the CDC as an evidence-based organization um, that we are all a part and trying to stay focused on doing that which shows measured gain and improvement um, is so very important as opposed to what families face in terms of the therapeutic options, which is everything from auditory enhancement to holding your baby and apologizing to your baby, holding them tightly, saying, mommy, sorry, to um, all kinds of nutritional therapies. Um, it's very complicated. It's critical, um, like it is with audiology, although we don't have the 
the 136 specificity. We do have what you were describing in terms of the necessary screening at the pediatric level that inter early intervention is critical, not losing children to follow up when there's a suspected disability um, is, is fundamental. The research has shown very cl clearly early intervention matters. Early intervention matters. What is it that we as a culture, as a country, have not resolved the fact that the cost and the consequences of failing to act early in these cases across the spectrum of disease is fundamental. Um, and the access issue to be able to do that, whether it's rural or urban, rural, underserved or urban, telehealth becomes a mechanism. One of the beautiful things about the nature of autism is I've, I've yet to run into uh, a kid with autism who doesn't love their iPad or the computer or screen-based intervention. At the University of Virginia, we do uh, both developmental pediatrics, um, educational interventions and training using telehealth. And one of our developmental pediatricians tells a beautiful story about at the end of a session, being able to observe the whole family, zoom in and out, work with the child, make medication decisions with the family. Is the child coming up and hugging the screen? at the end of the session. It's about connection. And so as we talk about this uh, multidisciplinary team, I just wanted to give you an example of who was on Cora's team. Um, all of these providers, uh, we try to coordinate as best as we can uh, together to try to understand how strategies across different goal areas may be aligned, um, what's working for Cora, what might not be working for Cora, um, to um, to fully provide that coordinated effort. Um, and so I have a couple videos to share of what this telehealth session looks like. Um, our process um, for this bathing routine uh, was really allowing uh, her mother to pick this goal. And that's because um, when we identify goals um, that are meaningful to us, we're motivated to follow through with them. That's everyone the room, right? Um, and then the focus is on problem solving and identifying solutions. Um, intervention is situated in authentic contexts, which I, I keep emphasizing uh, those authentic contexts to foster generalization. And then the interdisciplinary team of professionals supports the families throughout this process. So really, you'll hear Cora's mom uh, talk about what's worked for her previously and how she continues to implement those strategies that she's learned from uh, her ABA therapist um, into home routines. So um, this is just an example of uh, one of our OTs working with the parent. This is just in a second session to try to identify goals for what the parent would like to work on. So let's start that video. I can start it. She's met so much already. I'm, I'm just amazed. Right. <laughs> yeah, she, and that's why her OT loves her. She said, everything I set for her, she just bangs it out and we just move <laughs> on. I'm like, yes, that seems to be the trend. I hope we can get that going with the other two therapies, but we're pretty grateful. So yeah, she's been great. Um, and then also one thing that I had written down too, and I don't know if this is still, um, and it was from last time. And I know you had mentioned something about, um, for having more independence with the bathing routine. Yes. Watching herself. Um, and I'm not sure if we fully addressed that or not. <laughs> no, we didn't. Um, I got her, she got a wash rag that had like the Disney princesses and then she has one that has uh, Frozen or something on it. And that was our goal to have her start washing herself. Um, I don't know if I followed through with that one as well as I needed to yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I know like lotioning and stuff she is doing on her own. Okay. Um, but I will tackle that one a little bit better this week because I kind of slacked on it. Um, just because it's we're doing most for bath early in the morning where she's like halfway there still. <laughs> I, we both are, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, I'll tackle that one this week for sure. And I'll make sure I do a better job on it. Because I think I know that she'll do fine at it just because that she she's very much aware of like her body and people not crossing any, you know, any boundaries mm -hmm. and 
she's really good about that, which I'm really grateful for. Yeah. So I know if she had a preference of us not washing her, I know that would be what she would want. So mm -hmm. um, I will jump on that one this week though, for sure. Okay. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if you wanted me to make, if you want to make that a goal with us. Yes, to work on I would love okay. to. I would love to. Cause I mean, even if we could get her to a point where she was really essentially getting herself ready, you know, bathing, yeah. lotioning and dressing, and then I would do her hair. That'd be awesome. So you can see how motivated that mom is to talk about it. And she even expressed guilt for not practicing it, even though they had not talked about it last week. So I wanted to make that clear from that video. She's like, I'll jump on it next week. Like, okay, that sounds great. Um, and so uh, in this clip, in this quick clip, you'll see the OT using some reflective questioning and guided discovery to try to get the mom thinking about um, what are some other strategies that you have used. And also um, just, I'm trying to think too, of uh, even like beforehand when you've gotten her to be really independent with other routines, um, are there any strategies from those routines that you feel would work well for this bathing routine? I think so. I think we generally kind of go with the same direction every time. We put a preferred element into it to gain mm -hmm. her interest and then slowly we take the prompts away. But for bathing, it'd be even easier because the rags will always be there, uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, um, and we can get her fun loofahs and all that, you yeah. know crayons or you know they have so many things that can make her enjoy being in there and oh, yeah definitely her own thing so yeah we'll just do the prompts and slowly fade away <clears throat> so clearly her, Can I just her say, <laughs> prompt fading it's working isn't it <laughs> I, this was also a really really engaged mom who yeah, <laughs> so i chose these as like a best case <laughs> Okay, um, and then just here she talks directly about um, her interdisciplinary team. That's amazing. So kind of, yeah, it sounds like those are some great strategies. But you I just fade the prompts. Yeah, I just yeah. fade it a little bit at a time into something, you know, one step in the right direction, but never, if I go too fast, I can always start over again, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I, I take it slow and I kind of just walk. You get to know them so well, I just watch her behavior. If it's a fight or flight instinct or she's handling it okay. Um, and it's worked. The ABA has taught me a lot. I can I can take a situation and I can kind of figure out, you know, how are we going to get this, um, you know, outcome and kind of figure out techniques to do with it. But I'm amazed. It gives me self confidence because she's doing great. <laughs> yes, that is amazing. I mean, I am so impressed too. And that she's already getting fruits and that she's doing great in the grocery store walking. I mean, wow, that's right. Doing um. Another quick just side note, One, the research also shows that increased parent self-efficacy might be an active ingredient in some uh, treatments and for uh, families of children with autism. And you can see this mom clearly say, I have more confidence now to try these things. So she's trying some of these things across routines um, that probably perpetuate some of those, um, some of those great results. I am not going to play this last video. Uh, it's just an example of how the mom talks about different times of day that they could try the bathing. Um, and it's just another example of how the OT can really talk through uh, some other uh, strategies that might work. Um, reimbursement for telehealth, um, I'm more familiar with the occupational therapy uh, side of this issue. Um, I'm working with um, our national organization as well as um, some organizations in Illinois to talk um, policy and talk with our, our legislators about reimbursement uh, for occupational therapy services. We are not, uh, OTs are not uh, approved uh, for telehealth uh, reimbursement. Um, and uh, my area, of course, is uh, with younger children. And so um, early intervention uh, in some states, including Colorado, some other states, have great, great programs and they're showing great outcomes uh, for reimbursement um, for related service providers uh, with telehealth. So um, that's just uh, an issue that um, 
that arises consistently, and then uh, licensure portability. So um, as a related service provider, occupational therapy, if I provide services to an individual uh, that resides in Missouri, I have to be licensed in Missouri. Um, my Illinois license will not um, apply for that. And so also our national organization is working uh, towards some licensure portability issues. I will say too, um, I've been involved in some uh, training for professionals implementing telehealth. A lot of professionals are really um, interested in it, um, but many times I hear, Lauren, I, I can't put my hands on the kid. I need to put my hands on the kid. And it's like, well, you don't really. You know, let's think of some other ways. Let's, let's think of this as an issue that, that we need to think bigger about how we can serve families and children without being there directly. So I think that that training, and David and I have talked about this, is just, it's a huge area that, that will increase. Yeah, you, you, that portrait of that mom um, tells you everything about what tra how training matters. If we're talking about one and, and 68 kids um, across the United States, the scope of that and the, what we have to do to train um, special ed teachers, resource room aides, um, folks in the church, um, the teacher in the classroom, the parents, grandmom, you know, that whole network of people, that resource doesn't really fully exist out there. It's very hard to. And you put that then in the context that they're not resources that pay for training or pay for the, re the clinical resources that the family needs. Um, and you'll see in a little bit, as I know it is already in the back of your minds, um, Andrew, uh, you, you nailed this issue. The consequences of this are astronomical cost, but both in terms of families, uh, institutions, communities, um, it's overwhelming. And you, in order for us, of course, to get to the place where we have uh, broad access to education and resource and, and learning uh, schedules and working in the home, got to have access to broadband. Um, we need to continue to push out in rural areas, urban areas alike, how families might have access to get over the digital divide. The tools have become remarkably easy, um, easier and easier all the time. Uh, when I started in telemedicine, the cost of a telemedicine setup was $160,000. Uh, Northrop Grumman put it together, um, and, and it was sort of hazy, and you had to look at it like this. And now, my, as my engineer always teaches me, I mean, it's as simple as a, a web RTC, sending someone an e email and having them click that email and having a secure connection, a HIPAA-compliant connection that allows for a secure conversation. Um, so we've got to get through those... Uh, the, those access to broadband, a solution that is really a federal solution and not the 50 states of healthcare in the United States of America, because this is everywhere and we have to solve access to waivers to get kids services they need, to take it into the natural environment, to that connected environment. It is, it is tough. I do not have a bathtub in my clinic at UVA. Might get one now, but I don't. And then, of course, there are all the other um, raft of, of disparities that keep us uh, from having the people who need the services gain access. Um, and this is what's behind it. This is just the money figure and not the human cost. Um, so I dealt with this for my whole life with Daniel. In Virginia, he did not have coverage for his autism. This was... It was, was the out of pocket for me. It was the tax deduction for medical expenses that just got taken away from most of the families I know who use that deduction within autism because it is, they pay for everything out of pocket unless they have waivers that assist them. So if you look at the, the, the levels, you know, if this is from the CDC of $10,000 a year, six times higher than a cost of a child who does not 
land on that spectrum, then if you choose to do the work that we're talking about, it's you know with a team-based approach, with OT, with uh, PT, with speech and language therapy, with with even with audiologists who we really need quite often in the early parts of our, our treatment with these kids to, to ABA therapists, it's very expensive. But look at the bottom line. And that number is low. That CDC number at 100,000 a year, that's climbing. And that's a that's 100,000 a year all the way out rather than a declining number um, for kids who get early intervention. This is on the surface why we do this. Um, the human costs are as well enormous. Um, all right, we'll oh. talk about this. Uh, this was a study that we recently, um, we recently submitted. So we just compared uh, telehealth occupational therapy to clinic-based and home-based. Um, and this is just occupational therapy. So uh, we found that um, the clinic-based model was uh, 2.64 times more expensive um, than using telehealth. Um, this was in a rural sample um, in Kansas that we based this off on, some of our study participants. Um, Families lost an average of 11.3% uh, of their annual salary due to lost wages um, and driving time. So in addition to those costs associated with autism, you know, also thinking about the, the lost um, income for our families too and how we, how we think about those and those analyses. Um, and then the telehealth OT sessions uh, saved each family about $3,700 uh, per family per year. And I just, for fun, wanted to think about these numbers in the context of those, um, I think it's 20, 28,000 military families. Um, and it came out to about $85 million a year. Um, and that would be just for occupational therapy. We're not talking about all of the other therapies. So telehealth has the potential to save huge amounts of money. It's not a replacement ever um, completely, but I think we can think of it as a, as a way to save money um, as, as a partial supplement, potentially. In, at UVA, um, we've been providing telemedicine services darn near as long as East Carolina. Um, we've had very similar experiences and programs. Um, in that time frame of the past 20 years, um, we have saved the residents of Virginia uh, some 16.9 million miles of travel to see a therapist or a doctor. Um, that's what it's all about, keeping people at home, um, hopefully shifting to this world where the patient will see you now, uh, to where we go, to where the patient is, to where the family is where we need to provide services because it saves time and money. And underneath that, of course, the well-being of families, which is what drives this. Um, the study that um, my buddy Lauren comes out of Kansas, the birthplace of telemedicine. Um, this one comes out of Iowa, those big, big Midwestern you know, um, states where you have to drive forever in a day. We think it's just Midwestern, but North Carolina's huge. Uh, Virginia, Lee County in Virginia, um, is actually further west than Detroit, Michigan. And so it's a seven hour drive from some of those fights, if we've all made it, to get to Charlottesville to see a therapist for a 60 to 90 minute session, to get a cochlear implant fine tuned rather than 20 minutes from their home. Uh, so the, the folks at Iowa did an exhaustive study um, over many years with many kids um, with autism and obviously the findings in that and now Vanderbilt has published a study as well showing the th same issues which is major savings in time, major savings in cost, major compliance. Um, the one study that we go to about the show rate and not losing people to care for us has been in, in child and family psychiatry. We're the largest provider of child and family telepsychiatry services in Virginia. Um, and our show rate compared to the in-office show rate is the difference between a 20% no-show rate and on average a 12% no-show rate. 
Not to mention it's always nicer to see a psychiatrist on the monitor rather than in the room with them. Um, so I'll let you say something, then I'll say something. Oh, um, April is Autism Awareness a Month. Um, and so I, I, don't know, I don't really have anything else to say about Light that. It Light it up blue. Light it up blue. Yeah, just, um, you know, so far we've covered two subjects. Um, and in both, you can see that this is a national policy question about how we treat our most vulnerable citizens. And so this is, this is not the issue of technology. This is really the issue of how we treat our children and their health care. Superb and beautifully coordinated between two states. Yeah. It was phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal. I wish I could, you know, all these presentations have been amazing. So we have room for about a few questions, yes? Um, so mine's a little bit more of a statement, but also kind of highlights some of the needs that, that I see. So I have a soon-to-be stepson who is, um, who is nonverbal. Um, and David actually has, has uh, been a, an, an invaluable source of wisdom, um, as I have come to know. Um, uh, Abel is his name. And, you know, some of the challenges are huge, and this is just within a couple counties of difference. Um, so my girlfriend and I, we actually, I moved her from the county she was in because the school-based services didn't believe that ABA was as good for him as it is. They believed that they were doing more good in that small school district where they could maybe provide him a full-time aid the next school year, maybe. And then we talk about Medicaid waivers. It is so daunting to look at a child's medication and say, hmm, I have five days of medication left and it's Thursday. I can't fill that until Sunday because they won't pay for it. It's now out of pocket to get that medication filled unless I wait until it's 90 plus percent gone. These are things that have to be addressed at some point. These are things that have to change because you know I can, I can speak truth to the, to the statement about how um, a mother with a child of autism, their stress level is that of a veteran. I can speak very much truth to that. My girlfriend's stress is huge. And then to have that medication piece and school saying that they can provide it when really they can't, the funding's not there. You know, so, so this is, telehealth is huge because the few times we've been able to coordinate um, sessions with, with VIA where he does receive outpatient therapy, we've been able to speak with his teachers through video and it actually allows his mother to be connected with his care instead of just hearing the reports back. It's a really good point. The pharmacists are going crazy about that, too. They, I have two brothers that are pharmacists. They're always complaining about that. I have a question. Yes, actually, uh, my question ties in with just your name, Brian, yes. what Brian just said, which is, do you envision that if we do make progress from a policy, you know, from a national perspective, that do you envision that there would be interdisciplinary teams that would be able to provide um, services for patients and their families, like military families in particular, where they are, for just this very reason that if you really had a system using telehealth where the same team could follow the child and the family where they are, that that would lead to more continuity of care. And I would imagine for children with autism, that would, um, that would, you know, th there'd be fewer transitions along the care continuum for them. Follow, follow the money, right? This is an issue of follow the money. If the OT is reimbursed for his or her services, um, the system's designed and hire people to provide the services, the families, um, that one of the things I think in this issue of loss to care that's so powerful for me is, is also the expectation that anybody cares, that, that really they're gonna take care of me, that we eliminate those kinds of barriers, psychological barriers, money barriers, we suddenly become um, Holland overnight. Welcome to Amsterdam and have a nice day where they do things right. Um, there are models. That's, a, that's really a very brilliant um, 
observation. Cleft palate teams have been working for 50 years, 75 years, and are, the protocols are well established. It's kind of astonishing yeah. that's not a, the it's case. A, yeah. It's astonishing to me that you can't reimburse speech language pathologists for all kinds of disorders where people are lost to follow up right. continually, whereas they could follow them if people could get services close to home. I think we have time for another uh, one more question. Janine? Here we go. I think, too, listening to all of it is highlighting to me that, that we all as telehealth providers need to band together because when it comes to reimbursement, a lot of it is for physician-delivered care right now, and it's not the rehab piece, which is critical, and you've got to have both. So I guess I'm really pre uh, reaching out to the physicians here in the room is that when you're going to bat for parity within your state or wherever, please go to bat for everybody. Not, and it's easy, I mean, it's so easy to think about what your focus is, I get that. But I really think we need to look at across the continuum of care, both preventive and rehabilitative, and everybody be for bat for each other. And when we go and we're talking about rehab, talking about the physicians too, and physicians, when you're looking for parity, please, for your services, go, yes, but they're gonna need rehab. They're gonna need follow-up. So if we could all be addressing this united, I think, I would hope, you know, that we, we might get a little further along until we have that care. Sitting right down the, the thing from Neil, who knows that um, in his environment, every environment in healthcare is a collaborative care environment between skilled nursing, between other professionals, social work, psychology, mental health. It's critical. And so that reimbursement, there's another way that is value-based and bundled to say, here's how we take care of a child with autism in terms of the scope of their services. Yeah. Well, this was a spectacular presentation. Thank you so much. I'm very excited as we transition, you'll have a break now, but we're moving uh, to two physicians. We'll hear for, about concussions and um, let's see, I believe we're gonna hear about you know, neurology and from an orthopedic standpoint. Thanks, everybody. Um, this is pretty interesting. I've never had a presentation partner that wasn't physically with me. I've actually never met Kristen before, um, so we're all seeing her for the first time. Hey, Kristen. Hi. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we're kind of switching gears here a little bit. Um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is older adolescents and, and athletes. So as an orthopedic surgeon, um, you know, going through my training, I tried to shy away from kids that have really serious problems that we, we've already heard about. Um, but if, for any of you who have kids that play sports, you know, sports injuries, it's serious business, right? Uh, there's about $10 billion a year that someone is making off of these kids playing sports. So the adults want them playing, the kids want them playing, their parents want them playing. So it, it, it tends to affect people in ways that you would never imagine. And uh, I've learned a lot on my journey as an orthopedic surgeon uh, specializing in youth sports. And one of the things that we're kind of highlighting in, in our presentation is really trying to improve uh, the experience of the athlete and their parent, trying to streamline the care that they're getting, um, and trying to kind of help guide them along their, their journey of their injury, utilizing telemedicine. Um, so we, we, we talk about episodic care, right? So as a practicing clinician, uh, typically, when I see a patient, uh, that's the episode of which I'm, I'm seeing them. Um, but as you'll soon see in later slides, that that's not ideal um, in, in the way that it's being utilized now. And we have a couple of examples. Kristen will talk about um, a patient with a concussion uh, for most of the presentation. And I have a couple slides about a typical athlete with a musculoskeletal injury, the flow of care, how the care is delivered, how they see things. We go into the point of view theory that, that we kind of created. So everybody has their point of view, right? So as I stand up here in front of all of you, I have a certain point of view, and you all have a point of view of me, right? So it's the same thing in the clinical world. When a patient comes into the, to the doctor's office, they see what they see, and I see what I see, but it may not be the same thing, even though we're looking right at each other. And we'll have some examples of that. Um, we really do want to break down the current typical model of healthcare and how healthcare is delivered um, for a lot of smaller, minor kind of outpatient issues. Um, we introduced the idea of a telemedicine navigator 
um, and utilizing telemedicine to navigate people and their the children along the continuum of their problem. And then we talk about our kind of utopian society of an enhanced care model of how we wish things will look in the future, but not necessarily are looking currently. So again, in the, the patient experience with athletes specifically, they can be seen anywhere, right? They can be seen in the office, they can be seen on the field by an athletic trainer, they can be seen in the emergency room, um, they can be seen at the urgent care. But like I said, these are all episodes of the patient experience, right? The patient gets up, they go to the doctor, they have an interaction, then they get up and they go back home or go to wherever they need to go. And that is a particular episode. And you know, in the clinical world, we have these episodes and from the first second that they have their problem or their injury to the time that it's cured or they're better, um, we see them multiple different times. Sometimes you see them 10 times, sometimes you see them once. Um, but it's, again, these kind of episodes that we typically determine as providers. Um, and as a surgeon, we always have uh, time intervals. That's how we kind of break down how we see people, right? You have an injury, I see you, I evaluate you, I say go get an MRI, come back when it's done. That could be three days later, it could be three weeks later. I see you again, I review the MRI, then I say, okay, let's have surgery. The surgery will be scheduled at a particular date. So all of that is kind of predetermined when you're gonna come back and uh, be seen and evaluated. So Kristen, if you wanted to go through kind of a typical flow of care for a concussion patient. Sure, first of all, thanks for letting me remote in from chilly Boston. Hopefully you guys can hear okay? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so for concussion, it's initial episode, um, the sideline team is really the primary ones involved to kind of triage, is it a concussion, what happened, hopefully remove the student from the game. Um, and then typically within the first week, they usually see their pediatrician, given some recommendations, oftentimes they're told to stay home and rest. Um, follow up maybe a week later um, or two. The tricky thing with concussion is that depending on how the student is doing at each subsequent follow up, we don't have specific regimented timeframes. And if we try to do that, it doesn't work very well. People get really frustrated. So you may have a student who stays home and rests at, at one week and is fine by week two, or maybe thought they felt fine, tried to go back to school, got symptomatic again, kind of panicked a little bit, goes back to the pediatrician, um, is given some recommendations, tries to go to school again, there's anxiety, there's headaches, they're frustrated, they're getting behind. Um, and then finally, everyone, the pediatrician's getting a little bit frustrated, the patient and family are frustrated. So when we see kids in concussion clinic for neurology, it's usually around three or four weeks when they're not following the typical time course of getting better on their own. Um, and so then we have to backtrack through all those four weeks. What happened? What did you do? How did you feel? Um, and we're looking backwards to help them go forwards. And they're looking forwards to the SOLs and playing in the tournament um, so episodes of, of care are very individualized and can be a little bit tricky. Um, so here again, um, it's a, a little bit tricky with concussion for us in the clinic to know how best to, to help somebody because we haven't seen all the stuff that's gone on. Um, so we may have somebody who gets hurt when a games, they're usually on Friday, they're not on Monday, so you can call on Tuesday, they're usually Thursday, Friday. Um, had a sideline evaluation for an example patient, um, maybe gets removed from play, but it's already kind of set back in recovery, feeling lousy about it, it was really important game, the patient is thinking. Um, in the current, set up if that patient follows up with a pediatrician after a week you know a lot of times in neurology clinic we're kind of like oh my goodness like what was that management what did they do which is not very fair of us because we have the luxury of a long clinic visit 
if you're going to your pediatrician, it's a sick visit. Maybe there's 15 minutes. Um, so they kind of try to coach them through a little bit. Um, but it's probably a short visit and, and the student's probably still a little bit frustrated, especially staying home and resting. Um, if we go on a maybe a typical course, go back to school week three. So again, part of this is introducing different uh, areas of management. So athletic trainer initially, follow up with pediatrician, and now we're involving the school. Um, and our athletic trainers in Charlottesville are very good. They're very involved at school. But you have school saying, I can't teach this kid. They're falling asleep in class. They're struggling. They're frustrated. They're at the nurse's office all the time. We're sending them home. Um, and so that student is, is frustrated and thinks they're failing out of school, um, goes back to the pediatrician, and they're playing this waiting game to get in with specialty care all the while they're not getting better. Um, anxiety and everything is building frustration, isolation are all building. Um, and so again, this kind of illustrates by the time they get to us oftentimes what we have to go uh, back through. So, you know, that was an example of a concussion. So we'll kind of switch gears to a typical musculoskeletal injury. And again, I just wanted to highlight that usually the provider's point of view or where they're coming from is on the, going to be on the top of the arrow. The patient's point of view is going to be below that. But as you can see, they're running concurrently. Um, this kid, you know, has a knee injury. His initial episode, he's just a patient on my schedule. I see him. He has a knee injury. For him, he says, oh, you know, I hurt my knee. I went to see the doctor that day. Again, we're coming from two different places, but it's the same interaction. We follow them up, we get some sort of imaging, we diagnose with something, um, and then he sees it as he got an MRI and he was told that he needs surgery or he needs a procedure. Um, as you go along the surgery day, it's just a second case for me, it's just routine stuff that I'm doing, but as you can imagine, it's not routine for the patient, right? They're in a lot of pain, they're having issues, they're sick. Um, the post-op uh, evaluation, again, pretty quick and fast visit for me, we get in and we get out. Um, but for the patient, you know, they may be swollen, they may be in a lot of pain, they're, they're missing school, that sort of thing. Um, and this is just a theoretical timeline. So the second post-op visit, let's say we clear them back to sports or return to play. Um, at that point, the child has finished their physical therapy. They're kind of chomping at the bit to get back to their sport. That's usually, you know, once they realize the surgery went okay and they're done, the, the very next question is, when can I go back to playing? Um, so what we highlight here in red on this next slide are some of the things that are kind of behind the scenes. And that was kind of what we wanted to, to illustrate there. So when we go back in that same timeline, I know it's kind of small, I apologize, but in red, from my perspective, I'm seeing that kid, but I was on call the night before, right? That kid has no idea what I did the day before, but I do, right? My own kids do, because I wasn't home. And I show up to clinic, I've slept like two hours, and I'm still here to provide care for this child. But that's unbeknownst to them. And again, you know, this child, his mom had to take off work to bring him to the doctor's office. Do I know that? No. Do I ask? Not typically, but it's something that happens and it affects how both the provider and the patient are experiencing that interaction. And again, there's just a bunch of examples, right? So at the follow-up week one visit when we're going through the MRI, my resident didn't come to clinic, right? So that's gonna affect me. Now I'm doing twice the amount of work with half the amount of help and it's gonna affect how quick and how fast and how short I am with the patient, how I'm interacting with them. And the child is nervous. I read their MRI, I said, oh, you have a meniscus tear, let's book you for surgery, okay, I'm moving to the next patient. This is a huge blow to their system, right? They don't know what a meniscus is, now it's torn and they need surgery, so they're crying. Parents are usually crying, very upset. Um, when we get to surgery, uh, a lot of times we're delayed, right? I show up, a kid has appendicitis, a kid was run over by a bus, and they delay my cases. Well, guess what? Now I'm not a happy camper, right? So when I walk into pre-op to sign them up for surgery, again, that's gonna affect my demeanor, it's gonna affect how I'm, how I'm interacting with them. Um, and they're thinking about the school dance they're missing that day, right? Because if you can't go to school that day, then you can't go to the, <laughs> the nighttime and afternoon activities. So that's like what's on their mind. Um, again, so the next, the next thing, a lot of times I leave clinic early because I have to go to a conference, like here. I know it's Sunday, but let's say it's a weekday. So I'm rushing, moving as fast as I humanly can to get out of clinic so I can catch my flight. Again, I'm gonna be interacting with the patients in a different way and they have no clue what's going on in my head. Um, sometimes people don't show up, right? They don't show up to physical therapy, they don't show up to their visit. What do we say? They're non-compliant, 
We don't ask them why they didn't show up. We don't know that they have six siblings who have all this other stuff to do. We just say they're non-compliant, and that's going to affect how we interact with them. Um, sometimes we get sick, right? My ki I have little kids. They get me sick all the time. I still have to go to work. It's going to affect how I'm interacting with people. So you kind of get the gist of things. Um, and from the kids' point of view, sometimes they lose positions because they're not playing and, and they're missing tryouts and all sorts of things. So this is kind of some silly examples, but it's really to highlight how there's so many other factors that go into the actual encounter and the actual episode. And for those of you in the clinical world, we, we get evaluations and we do Prescani scores and all this stuff. And a lot of what patients are satisfied or not satisfied about has very little to do about the healthcare that's actually transpiring. Um, and I never really stopped to think about it until I've been in my practice for a few years um, and just kind of being more introspective and thinking, okay, well, how is my mood or what I'm going through affecting this visit and vice versa? Um, and as surgeons, we're, we're pretty guilty of this. We, we tend to get in and out. We tend to get to the point because, you know, we, we have the RVUs to do and we have to, to bill and, and make money and we have a lot of pressure on us. So we kind of get in this habit of using people as commodities, but in actuality, they're not, as you all know. Um, and we do really have to stop and think about the interactions that we're having with our patients. So I use this one example of the first initial episode and kind of break this down. So like I said, from the provider view and the patient view, they're two very different things, right? This could be my 10, 15 patient. He's 15, he has a knee injury. That's all I know about him. I know that my medical assistant had trouble loading the x-ray that he brought from his outside emergency room visit. That's slowing me down, right? It's interfering with how quickly I can see him. The patient was 30 minutes late but it's a 20 minute visit. So now I'm even more behind the eight ball. I have 35 other patients that I need to see. And at that particular visit, we send him for an MRI, we give him a gym note, we, we tell him to stay out of sports. His view is a little different, right? He's supposed to come a little bit early for his 10, 15 appointments so we could load x-rays and take history and information. He's worried about a math test that he missed that day. And like I said, his mom had to take off work to bring him there. So right then and there, before I even set in the room, uh, step in the room, the mood is already set on both sides, right? And again, these are all things that Either side has no ideas going on. Some people's cars break down, they get late, and that's what they notice, but all I know is they're late to their appointment. How can they not prioritize to come see me, the surgeon, right? How dare they be late? Um, I don't usually say that, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, they said the doctor was nice, but he seemed sleepy. What did I say? I was on call the night before, right? I don't walk in the room and say, hey guys, I was on call the night before. I just come in and do my job. But again, they did notice that, and then we do the thing with the MRI. So when you look at episodic care, there's a whole host of problems with it. Um, it's extremely fragmented. It's like you're taking all of these puzzle pieces and you're looking at them individually, but you're not putting them together. It's, it's affected by the re real life, real occurrences, real issues of real people, providers, patients, assistants, everybody. And there's a lot of missed opportunities for interventions in between the episodes. And one of the things that, that, that I get frustrated about is because we're mandated to give patients a lot of discharge instructions and after visit summaries and all, we give them like 18 pieces of paper after they leave their visit. I have no idea if they read any of it. I don't know if, if they can read any of it. I don't know if they lose it. But I give it to them, I check some box and my administrator's happy and everybody goes about their business. But between the time I give that to them and the time they come back, I have zero clue how any of that information got transpired to them. So we're trying to think about how to utilize telemedicine to reach those opportunities where we couldn't reach out to people. And again, the point of view theory is it's, it's very, that's gonna depend on how the people see how things go and how their visit um, occurs. And again, it's from both sides. The patient, it only exists to the provider on their clinic day. When I'm operating, I'm not thinking about the patients in clinic, but guess what? They still exist, and so do their problems. And the patient, their problem is continuous. It's not this thing that, you know, today I got hurt, and week one when I go see the doctor, my problem's there, and week four, it's, the, it's every single second of every day. And again, I'm just an orthopedic surgeon, right? I'm not doing heart surgery, I'm not doing brain surgery. These are quote unquote minor things. But for those of you that played sports when you were younger and have kids that play sports now, you know it can be a huge, huge problem, depending on the severity of the injury, obviously. Um, each side of the coin have life experiences and life events that affect the flow and the perception of the episodes and how everybody's interacting with one another. So these are some of the opportunities. Um, we, we touched on that each party has no knowledge of what's going on with the other party. The patient is left alone 
to navigate this journey. Think of all the places that you go where people are harassing you to help you, right? You go to a store to buy a shirt, you got somebody breathing down your neck telling you everything about the shirt. You, go to, you can't go to a car dealership without being mobbed by five people, right? This is healthcare. Why would I give you 20 pieces of paper and say, okay, next patient, and then you just push you out the door? You have to know where to go get the MRI. You have to know where to go to get physical therapy. You have to know that I prefer a, a closed MRI as opposed to an open one. I prefer a 3.0 Tesla magnet as opposed to a 1.5 Tesla magnet. Do I stop and tell people that? No. When they bring me back an MRI that's an open one with a poor magnet, then what do I do? I get upset. And then I tell them to go back and get a better MRI. So why didn't somebody debrief with them after that first visit and say, hey, listen, Dr. Atanda gave you this. Do you know where to go get it? Do you know what you need to do? That kind of thing. Um, and in terms of uh, as athletes, the provider has very little contact with the patient and other key members of the school, i.e. the athletic trainers and the physical therapists, during the gaps in between these episodes. And again, there's a lot of opportunities at which we can touch people at these time points. So Kristen, if you want to touch on some of the research here. Yeah. So um, like we were talking about before, it seems at least for the ortho injuries, ortho is kind of an obvious injury. Something's swollen and red and they're limping. Um, concussions can sometimes fly a little bit under the radar, but just um, like we were talking about, it's a huge impact on um, the student's life, the school, the family. Um, and everybody wants to know prognosis and things after concussion. Um, one of the things that we found is how you manage the early expectations, um, in terms of what are you expecting after you get a concussion? And it's tough because not everybody's concussion behaves the same way. Um, everybody is a little bit different in terms of what they bring to it. Did you have a history of headaches or anxiety? What was the circumstance? Was it a car accident? Was it the biggest game in your high school career? Um, and all of those things, including the school environment, the sports environment, the environment that you go home to, are gonna play some role in recovery from concussion. So there was a study um, done, it's an old study now, but still holds true, looking at groups of patients who were just given some basic education, like, hey, here's what to expect. You're gonna feel pretty crummy for a while, don't panic. Um, these are some things you can do to help get you through that time, and then you should start to feel better versus patients who were not given any educational materials. And just the simple fact of providing that, that education, that feeling not so great is okay, you will get better. This feels like the biggest, most devastating thing, but it's not a life-changing experience for you. You will get through this. That made a huge amount of difference. So um, especially with all of the, the, hype around concussion, which is good. We've managed to, uh, I think, let people know how important it is, and how we should take it seriously. There's also a lot of panic that goes on. So now our job has gone from people you got to pay attention to bringing the pendulum back to, yes, this is serious, but just like a meniscus injury or some other orthopedic injury, it can get better and you need to give it some time and here's how we can help you. Um, so when they follow up with people that have just had that little bit of education, it is impressive how, um, how much a difference that can make, but that's hard to get the education if there's nobody to give it to you. If you're having competing sources from school and primary care and friends and teachers, so doing something like the telemedicine, um, interventions would potentially be really helpful, um, in alleviating a lot of the angst that our patients have. Introduce the idea of a telemedicine navigator. Just like you have a tour guide when you go to the museum, you're gonna have a guide for whatever issue or problem that you have. And again, we, we focus on the fact that it's a continuum. It's not a, Ill, it's not a very discreet, defined thing um, that only happens at certain time points. And the way we would envision it would be like a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, even an MD, 
um, that would be kind of assigned to this person and shepherd them through uh, their journey and along, along the path of their problem. Um, and you want them to be, you know, there has to be a, a member of the provider team, right? It can't just be a physician assistant who's never worked with me. It should be somebody that has been working with me for however long, and now they're kind of adopting this new role. And this can be really good for education. It can be good for prepping the patient for upcoming visits, debriefing with the patient after visits. Um, and they can serve as a patient, I'm um, sorry, as a person to provide communication um, between patients and providers and in our situation, athletic trainers, physician, uh, physical therapists and such. In terms of workflow, you'd want this person to be EMR savvy, right? So what would be really nice if they, you have an upcoming visit, uh, the navigator can, can talk to the patient at some point when it's convenient for them, take all that information, put it into Epic or your EMR, so that now you show up as the provider, you have half of your note already done, you've had some of your workflow already handled for you. You don't want it to be burdensome and create more work for you. Um, and you know, I put the last line there, so we talk about telehealth, it doesn't always have to be video conferencing, right? The way I think about it, it's using telecommunications and technology to interact with people. Um, if you prefer a phone call before or after your visit, that's fine. If you prefer a text message or an email or a video conferencing um, app, uh, I think that's all nice. It's not really, um, the most important part isn't the modality of, of how you're engaging the patient it's the fact that you're doing it. Because currently, we pretty much don't do it at all, at least in, in, in our particular um, world. So we have a nice little example that Kristen is going to go through, kind of highlighting, highlighting kind of a utopian society of what we would envision um, a concussion uh, treatment protocol to look like. Yes, this would be utopian society um, that we all have a lot of hours and time in our day to be able to be that navigator um, and to communicate with the athletes. It would be great if we could be free enough to do this. So we're just going to pretend that we can, um, and we're going to go with one athlete at a time. Um, so if you look at day two, this would be really great for us with those Friday night games, right? I actually had a parent ask me the other week, well, you guys are not open on Saturday or Sunday, are you? And I said, no, we're not. I would, but there'd be no staff. So this would be a way for somebody to, to connect up with that in, injured athlete, say on a weekend, um, when they are in probably the toughest couple of days of their concussion in terms of headaches and dizziness and maybe throwing up and their parents are freaking out thinking, do I have to wake them up every hour during the night? Are they going to be okay? Um, so this is a great opportunity to have the navigator connect up with the athlete um, or the provider with the athlete in some fashion to say, these are the warning signs to look for if you have you know, vomiting in the middle of the night, if your balance is really terrible, if you're weak on one side of your body, et cetera, whatever, um, discuss, these are the things you should really be worried about. Go to the ER. Um, or these are things that you should be expecting for these first couple of days. Um, here are some tips to help get you through for acute management. And then um, if the navigator can gather some information from the athlete and the family about what the symptoms are, what happened, and is able to give that back to the provider, then that sets up um, that athlete-provider connection and helps determine maybe next steps or when the next um, point in time to touch base would be. Um, so here's another example. Uh, day seven, say an athlete may be trying to go back to school or maybe touching base with the pediatrician. Um, I still have headaches, my eyes hurt, I can't read. The provider pediatrician might say, well, let's go um, back to partial days and start some light physical activity. And the athletic trainer um, might be able to develop a gradual light physical activity plan. Well, this is really helpful if everybody knows what's going on. So it's not just the athlete talking to the provider saying my head hurts. Um, and I'm tired, but it's the athlete talking to the navigator who helps coordinate the provider and the athletic trainer saying, how can we make sure that we're all on the same page 
to get this student um, started back to active recovery. The next. Um, so school. Maybe an athlete has returned to school with some academic adjustments and is having trouble making it through the day. This might be a point in time we're getting on two weeks now and the athlete's starting to get real frustrated. The navigator says, you know what? Sounds like this is really frustrating for you. We've been doing our best to help provide you with some tips and some management expectations, but it's probably best that we get you in to see the, the provider and maybe get you a little bit more um, attention and specialized care. Next. So that visit happens. Um, and they decide that this person needs to have some physical therapy for their associated whiplash and needs to have some occupational therapy to help with the vision changes that are still going on and strengthening up some eye muscles. Um, this with the telehealth can provide a way for the athletic trainer, the physical therapist, occupational therapist provider to all be in communication with each other in the best interest of the athlete to kind of coordinate the plan so that the athletic trainer is not asking them to do different things than the PT is and the provider knows what's all going on and can get feedback from those therapists and athletic trainer as to how things are going. Go next. Um, again, same thing, but going back to school, now we've involved the guidance counselor even. So we have the athlete, the navigator, or the athletic trainer, or the guidance counselor, getting this student back to graduated return to academics as well as um, physical activity and kind of determine what the best adjustments and goals are for the athlete. And then a time for all that whirlwind of things happen. We basically didn't do too much for the first couple of weeks. They were kind of resting mode. Now we're going back to active recovery. So how are you doing with all of this? Um, do you understand the plan moving forward? How have these little steps helped? What feedback do you have? Do we need to, to tweak anything going forward? Okay. Okay, so this is a quick example of how I would really appreciate um, some good solid telehealth right now. So we have an athlete who sustained a concussion is now several weeks beyond. She's already been to the specialty clinic and I am getting communications on email from her athletic trainer saying that the athlete keeps going back and talking about headaches and difficulty to concentrate. The athlete hasn't called our clinic. I don't know why. Maybe they have a phone that ran out of batteries. That's quite common. People get the temporary phones. Um, maybe they're worried that we're going to take her out of sport. I don't know, but she's telling the athletic trainer there's a problem. Athletic trainer talks back to the athlete, says, tell your mom, tell your mom to call the clinic. Mom calls the clinic. Clinic talks to mom, does something to the athlete. In a lot of these non-direct means of communication are happening where I would really love to be able to have uh, a phone call with that athlete in the athletic trainer's office, maybe with her mom to just say, okay, look, we can't get you back into clinic right now. What can you tell me about what's going on and how can we help you get through this in a much more direct way than all of this uh, multiple telephone conversations. So um, just a few take home points. We try to highlight that uh, the current state of, of episodic care is not ideal um, and that we're not addressing the fact that the patient's problem is a continuum. We do think some sort of model where you have like a navigator or a guide would be optimal and that there are a lot of opportunities for engagement and ways to bridge and connect the patient and the provider. And hopefully it can improve outcomes and satisfaction in, in the experience of the patient. I think as we move towards value-based healthcare, and working on satisfaction and trying to improve the experience of the patient in front of us. I think streamlining the care and getting information from them before and after the visit, as opposed to waiting till they're in front of us is gonna be more ideal. For all the, those of you who've ever waited at a doctor's office and wondered what they're doing back there, it's all information exchange, right? My assistant goes in and comes out, my resident goes in and come out, I go in and come out. 
We spend 30 minutes with the patient, probably 28 of those minutes is just getting up to speed and figuring out what's wrong with them. Imagine a world where you could figure all of that stuff out before they show up and they come in front of you and you know everything about that particular time and their problem. You know what their expectations are, you know what their challenges are, so you can spend those 30 minutes treating them as opposed to talking to them and just shuffling information around. And that's a very simplistic view of it, but sometimes as a provider, that's the way we feel. Like, oh, that would have been really nice if I knew that before mom showed up. Or that would have been really nice if somebody let me know yesterday that they had this issue or problem because it would affect how I would, I would interact with them today. Um, so yeah, the uh, telemedicine navigator. Thanks. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, all right, that was spectacular. Thank you. I'm just enthralling. Okay, now we go to, you know, if you weren't depressed already, <laughs> we're going to palliative care, which is a good thing. It can be not depressing. I don't mean to suggest it is. Um, we have Dana Morrissey, Clinical Research Coordinator, Department of Neurology, University of Virginia Health System, and Lakshmi, I hope I did that right, uh, Vadia Nathan? Close enough. Okay, thank you. And they're going to talk about the older adult in the home setting and with a movement disorder. This is a very interesting case. Dana and I are delighted to be here to talk about telemedicine for individuals with movement disorders. And I just want to say that all of the uh, discussions and talks that we've had so far, even though they've been about individuals with diff at different stages in life, with different types of conditions. What I see is really a wonderful thread, a pattern of uh, how we could leverage telemedicine, telehealth, uh, across the continuum of care, um, really empowering family members and loved ones to solve problems at their end, and then uh, navigate, you know, use it as a navigation tool for better continuity. And um, the, you know, the, the concussion and sports injury uh, talk that we just had, really thank you because you've set a really nice foundation for us to uh, segue into uh, chronic conditions and, and the role of palliative care. Very briefly, movement disorders are a group of neurologic conditions that are characterized by abnormal increased or decreased movements that affect an individual's normal pattern of motor activity. So these tend to be chronic progressive conditions that affect an individual's functionality and quality of life. The majority of them do not have curative treatments, so the treatments really are directed towards managing symptoms, optimizing an individual's functionality, and quality of life. Some of these conditions over time also cause cognitive and behavioral disturbances. So these, are, these have profound impact not only on individuals, but their loved ones as well. And some are hereditary, so the whole family becomes the patient. Just very briefly, what is palliative care and palliative medicine? There is considerable confusion. And one of the reasons is because palliative medicine is a medical specialty like cardiology or oncology, but palliative care is also a concept that ideally should be integrated across the continuum of care. So palliative medicine is a med medical specialty that focuses on relieving the symptoms and stress related to a serious, uh, an individual with serious health condition the goal is to improve quality of life for patients and their loved ones. And really it's appropriate at any age and at any stage of a serious illness if there is an unmet palliative need. Primary palliative care is a concept. It's really fundamentally integrating palliative care principles in an individual's routine care. And so such care is provided by primary care doctors, specialists, disease management teams like Dana's at UVA. And it's about symptom management, clarifying goals of care, communication, things that patients and families should receive uh, along the disease trajectory. 
specialized palliative care, which is what I do as a palliative care physician, is about patients who have complex medical conditions, serious or advanced health conditions, with difficult to control symptoms, need for complex medical decision making, understanding prognosis, providing psychosocial support, spiritual support, and that is provided by specialized teams in an interdisciplinary fashion, that is different specialists providing care in a coordinated manner, and um, you know, it involves social workers, chaplains, physicians. And with that, I will turn to Dana to talk about, um, I'll go back so you can do that, to talk about uh, your experience with, uh, in your clinic with Huntington's disease patients. Thank you. Thanks for having us here. Um, I, I would sort of echo Lakshmi's statement that there are a lot of themes that you're going to see sort of drawn out in this presentation and these cases that have come up in, in all of the rest of the presentations you saw today. Um, the other two that really stand out to me are sort of using telemedicine to break through barriers that are really isolating patients that are the most needy patients and the most isolated, um, whether that's because of where they live or because of their condition. Uh, and then also sort of the importance of being able to do therapy and rehabilitative services in an authentic environment. Um, that's a huge, huge piece of, of what makes telemedicine important to Huntington's families. Um, let's see. So before I tell you a little bit about our case, I wanted to just tell you about our clinic model here. Um, whether or not we're seeing a patient via telemedicine or in person in the clinic, they're getting access to the exact same multidisciplinary team. Um, we're really lucky to have this wide array of providers sort of at our fingertips one day, one day a month who are designated to this clinic for the entire day. So not every patient is going to see every one of these providers, but depending on their needs, they're all available. Um, <clears throat> Now, there are a lot of rehabilitative services in this team, you'll see, but I sort of want to emphasize here that our rehab team is really focused on maintaining function versus restoring or gaining function. These patients are in need of what we sort of think of as supportive care or primary palliative care, and that's what the rehab team is working on. They're not looking at trying to regain uh, the ability to walk or regain strength in their arms so they can go about their daily life. They're not going to regain it. They're just to have to live with their new normal and figure out how to navigate that in a better way. Um, <clears throat> so they're focusing on preventing complications, managing symptoms, maintaining function, and therefore hopefully maintaining independence and improving quality of life. Um, you know, I think this is, this is a really good example of how you expand the concept of palliative care across an illness experience and uh, rehab services in our clinic at least are just a huge 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 piece of that we we joke a lot about needing one of those like huge theater hooks to drag our rehab team out of the clinic visits because they're spending upwards of an hour often with our with our patients it's like it is absolutely the most valuable time they get in the clinic and our, uh, our neurologists are often sort of leave the room saying, let me get out of the way for the real doctors to get in here and do their work. So it's a, it's a huge part of the clinic. Um, and then you'll see sort of on the other side of the screen, um, we'll have our patient and their caregiver and depending on, on where we're seeing them, uh, we might be seeing them in a long-term care facility where they're the physical therapist that's sort of in residence at the long-term care facility who works with them often is also joining the visit or their nurse is joining the visit. Um, and sometimes we see patients at home where it's there are no providers there and it's really just the family and any other caregiver that is sort of a regular part of their life. Um, and I, I just want to point out sort of in this scenario, often the patients are operating the technology on their end of, of the encounter. So <clears throat> that can sometimes present some difficulties depending on what generation <laughs> our patients are, um, with their age isn't. But um, it, the, 
it's really getting sort of easier and easier as time goes by to figure out how to make those connections. And we see the value of pushing through those barriers <clears throat> um, more and more as we've gotten more experience with it. Uh, so I just wanted to touch really quickly on, on some research. But before I do that, I want to share a little bit about our sort of anecdotal experience. And we're in the process of writing this up, but it's not done yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but we, we have really found that, that doing telemedicine encounters and exams, especially on Huntington's patients, gives us a more representative view of their, their function, their baseline function. Because the stress of travel, especially when they're traveling from Lee County in southwest Virginia up to Charlottesville for seven hours, or seven hours that turns into 12 hours if you're a Huntington's patient, um, it just wreaks havoc on their system. So by the time they get here and maybe spend the night at a hotel on the way, they're they're not at their baseline when they're there for an exam. So none of our team is getting to see them in a place where you know we actually understand what their day-to-day -day challenges are. Um, it also really has shown it sort of strengthens our our bond with the patient and the family. So. You know, we we don't necessarily have a dedicated patient navigator, but we do find that the patients that we've done telemedicine encounters with call us and communicate with us more often via email, via phone. So by the time we do have that next episode of care with them, whether that's another telemedicine visit or an in-person visit, we know so much more about what's been going on in between, and we start with that advantage when we start that next visit. Um, and then again, as I already said, it really gives us a window into that home environment. So especially the rehab team can actually watch, you know, the patient navigate the difficult transfer from, you know, from standing to the toilet and look at how their bathroom is designed and what tools they might need to sort of help them do that more safely. Um, there isn't, there isn't a lot of research on movement disorders in telemedicine specifically. Most of it is on Parkinson's uh, disease, so we're sort of extrapolating here. But it, it, it's increasing access to specialty care, which is not unique to movement disorders. It really has shown to be very efficient on cost and time and miles traveled and money earned for families that are often really strapped. Um, and it, we also see that there is a really high patient interest in receiving remote specialty care, which is great, which now just means that we need to try to do more of it and see what the outcomes look like down the road. Um, and the clinicians generally are, are really receiving it well too, not just the clinicians that are providing the remote care, but also local clinicians who are sort of on the other end of that consult and wanting to be able to provide some care continuity when their patients are coming in for primary care visits or other kinds of consults with them. So it's, ex it's exciting. Um, and then, you know, just sort of down the road, there are some really neat remote symptom monitoring and detection systems that are coming into play with wearable sensors and things like that. So we might be able to do a lot more, you know, remotely uh, than, than just sort of do an exam in real time. Okay, so. Our case here, um, Mr. and Mrs. Tarp. Um, <clears throat> so this is a great example of a patient who is less and less able to travel as he needs more and more care. So ideal for telemedicine in our mind. Um, uh, Mr. Tarp is, is entering the later stages of Huntington's disease now, and it, we sort of more than we understood this first telemedicine encounter that we did with him proved to be just an incredibly supportive tool for his family. Um, so at this point, he's really experiencing symptoms that are cognitive, mood, motor, the whole gamut of Huntington's disease symptoms. Um, so, and... HD, just, just to be clear with you guys, is a, it's a hereditary neurodegenerative disease, and it affects, as, as Lakshmi said, motor, cognition, mood. It, it's also a hereditary disease, so it's, um, it's autosomal dominant, which means that it's passed from directly from one generation to the next. So in, in Mr. Tarp's case, his father had it, he has it, and his son also got it. So we're looking at three generations of men here who have been affected by, by Huntington's. Um, and I sort of, I point that out because it, 
for someone like him who experienced Huntington's as a caregiver for his father and watched his father pass away, is now experiencing it himself and and also watching as a parent his son experience it and lose custody of his grandchildren. You know, it the list goes on and on. But just to point out how incredibly isolated and overwhelming um, this disease is, how for his caregiver, his second wife is his caregiver, she's his sole caregiver, they don't have any help. A lot of Huntington's families don't use respite care. His first wife is his son's sole caregiver because his wife left him. And the only support that those two women have are each other. So when one of them has to go to an appointment or go grocery shopping, the other one brings the one patient to the other home. <laughs> Which is, I mean, it's just amazing. So again, the most needy families are really benefiting from, from this access. Um, so Mr. Tarp, quickly, he's, he needs sort of assistance with all of his activities of daily living some more than others, but at this point, um, the, the two sort of really big issues on the table were helping him sort of assess what was going on with his anxiety and depression, because we realized that his anxiety around um, having a bowel movement and being afraid that he was gonna lose control of his bowels was actually what was preventing him from coming into clinic. So we initiated this telemedicine encounter because he had missed two clinic appointments, which means we hadn't seen him for almost 15 months, um, which is a long time for someone who's in the later stages of Huntington's disease. Um, and you know, his wife basically said, I, he wants to come to clinic, but I, I'm never going to be able to get him to actually leave the house in the morning because he gets overwhelmed by this fear. And then the other factor was that he's, he's starting to sort of need more physical support than his wife can provide, and what kinds of safety issues do we need to sort of problem solve quickly? What kinds of support can we get for them in the home? At the actual consultation, uh, this is sort of the core group that sees all of the Huntington's patients, and then as I said, we bring in genetic counseling or social work or psychiatry, depending on what the patient's needs are. And this is the group that saw Mr. Tarp. Um, so the one difference between a patient seeing this group in the clinic in person and via telemedicine is that when we see them via telemedicine, all of the providers see them simultaneously as a group. And we found that that is, is much more efficient, actually. We were sort of trying to figure out actually how to bring that model into the clinic because we found that the exams are redundant in some ways and that the providers learn a lot from listening to each other approach you know, problem solving in different ways. Um, so it's just, it's really kind of fascinating to see how the team has learned from this telemedicine program as well. But that, is, that aside, um, most, as I said, most of our patients spend the majority time at their clinic visits with the rehabilitation team. So the neurologist is often, you know, spending 20 minutes or so doing counseling and, and an exam. And then uh, it's not uncommon for our patients to be in clinic for upwards of two and a half hours. Um, and most of that time is with PTOT and speech language pathology. <coughs> um, and you know, as I as I've said before, I don't want to beat this this point, but the the value in the rehab team uh, seeing these patients at home or in their long term care facility is that they're able to sort of problem solve with eyes on the ground knowing what the real obstacles are in those spaces. So as patients are sort of moving through these safety issues and their challenges, they have the ability to say, to make suggestions that are very applicable or to, in Mr. Tarp's case, what we did was sort of say, okay, the, we've identified these as big safety problems that they, the family hadn't even identified and recommend that a home health PTOT go in and sort of follow up to actually figure out what the practical solutions are on the ground. Um, so I'll click over here to, to what our outcomes looked like on this particular 
telemedicine encounter. So uh, Mr. Tarp came in with um, some increased movement, so the neurologist adjusted his chorea medications to see if that would help control it better. Um, we talked about his anxiety, but didn't end up making any changes at that point, um, because mostly because he didn't want to, actually. So we sort of agreed, everyone agreed that we would keep an eye on it and then follow up with a, a psych visit via telemedicine if we needed to down the road. Um, and then, as I said, we, we made some referrals so the home health PTOT team could go in and really sort of do the on the ground work that we needed to implement these these precautions. Um, and we, we didn't know it at the time, but I think the most important thing that happened in this telemedicine encounter, as I said, we hadn't seen Mr. Tarp for about 15 months, was that we were able to reconnect with this family and reestablish care. Um, because what happened about a week later um, was after the, the home health had <coughs> services had started and Mr. Tarp was in his first physical therapy session, um, he, he voiced suicidal ideation to his physical therapist. And later that day, his wife found him sitting in his bedroom at his desk with a gun in his hand. Um, so the physical therapist just sort of did the right thing and stayed in the house with him, but she didn't know who to call because Mrs. Tarp didn't want to call 911. She didn't want to call the emergency room. So she said, I know, <laughs> we need to call the doctors at UVA. We just saw them. They know what's going on. Um, and the physical therapist called called us and said, "This is what's happening. I I've counseled her. She doesn't want to, you know, she doesn't want to call. Blah blah blah. Anyway, as a result of that relationship being reestablished, our doctors were able to pave the way for him to go to the emergency room at another Huntington's Disease Center of Excellence, which was closer to their home." They knew the, you know, one of the psychiatrists who works with the neurology team at that center of excellence. So they were able to call him and let him know that there was, they were sending a patient who was probably going to need a psych admission and that it was, you know, it was a Huntington's patient, so he should look out for it. And when, when he was ready to be discharged, they got a release of information so the social worker could call our team and make sure they scheduled telemedicine follow-up for Mr. Tarp when he got home so we could follow up on his psych needs and um, you know and and sort of check his medications and all the things we were planning to do aside from the the, the crisis um, but it I think this case really just sort of emphasizes how important it is for these families to feel like they have providers that they can count on and for families that have limited mobility or limited means because of a disease like Huntington's disease, telemedicine is really a brilliant way for us to be able to provide that access and, and to be accountable to them. Um, so that is Mr. Tarp's story. And with that, I will turn it back over to Lakshmi to tell you about um, another case where um, her team saw a Parkinson's patient in the hospital and was able to follow them through the care continuum. Very briefly, I am a palliative care physician and medical director of Shore Regional Palliative Care Program. We provide palliative care, specialized palliative care. We are an interdisciplinary team at the University of Maryland Shore Regional Health on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. We are a three hospital health system, geographically dispersed. That we also have one acute rehabilitation unit and a subacute long-term care facility. And Chester River Hospital and Shore Nursing and Rehab are separated from our main hub, which is Eastern Hospital, by about 40 miles. And we are 2.4 FTE providers, myself, another physician, and a nurse practitioner. And at one point, we were juggling patient care responsibilities across all of these facilities. So 
thanks to a grant from the Maryland Healthcare Commission and so technical support from the telemedicine department at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, we were able to launch a telepalliative care program. Our distance site, um, myself and my uh, you know, physician and nurse practitioner colleagues, we are able to use technology to see patients from our main hub, which is Eastern Hospital, and we are able to do that at Chester River Hospital as well as the subacute long-term care facility. And our model, speaking of the navigator, we have two palliative care nurses, you know, 1.0 FTE palliative care nurse stationed on site who actually evaluates patients at these two facilities and really is the bridge. And so the nurse evaluates the patient, establishes connectivity with the family, organizes the consultation at the time that the family is available to be present, and then we are able to connect remotely to evaluate the patient. The other thing is the nurse also makes sure that relevant information from specialists or anything that's relevant to the care of the patient is available ahead of time, and we are able to access that information via the electronic health record as well as a HIPAA-compliant messaging platform. So we are uh, one year into it now, and uh, we've certainly there's been an improvement in access. Uh, at, at these two sites, our referrals have increased threefold. I mean, those patients always existed, but we are more accessible to them now. I know, Dana, you've already reviewed this. So Evidence right now with telepalliative care is scarce in terms of what are the outcomes on patients and other relevant metrics. But uh, studies, particularly from the United Kingdom, where uh, telehealth, which is phone calls, video conferencing, you know, all of those modems, probably uh, has been most prevalent in the United Kingdom in palliative care and hospice. And what it does show is that the technology is usable and acceptable and likely has a role when distance, uh, distance, time, and cost constraints exist. And certainly that is our experience at Shore that the technology is usable and acceptable. It has, in fact, improved access to specialized palliative care. From a provider perspective, it has improved our workflow. We have not had to increase our staffing. Really, we're able to see more patients with the same staffing and we, it's more inclusive. I mean, we can get other special specialists. We can schedule the consultation at a time when other specialists or stakeholders are available to be present. And then we can also include distant family members. You know, the technology allows that as well, to be present during the evaluation. So we are looking at patient and family satisfaction scores, which really are consistently high. And we are also looking at some of the metrics that we are measuring as, as part of our project, too, is looking at the impact on emergency department visits and hospital readmissions. So the story of Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Mr. Jones, at the time that I saw him, was an 80-year uh, man with a 12-year history of Parkinson's disease. He was in the advanced stages of the disease at the time that I saw him that had really affected his functionality significantly. Mrs. Jones was his primary caregiver at home. He, he had very limited mobility, was able to walk short distances with a walker within his house. He was no longer able to manage his finances because he had dementia, early stages of dementia related to the Parkinson's. And because his, he had a, he had a lot of balance issues. He fell and fractured his hip. I mean, this is a very common scenario in patients like Mr. Jones and was admitted to Chester River Hospital, which is one of our destination sites. He underwent surgery, but had a very difficult post-surgical course because of very difficult to control pain, other symptoms, delirium. He had difficulty swallowing, which is a common um, complication in advanced Parkinson's disease. So he wasn't able to take his Parkinson's disease medications and he was really declining rather rapidly in the hospital. So a temporary feeding tube was recommended to resume his Parkinson's medications. And Mrs. Jones had concerns because 
Mr. Jones had told her several times he did not want a feeding tube. So a palliative medicine consultation was requested to assist with his difficult to control symptoms, but also clarify the treatment goals. My palliative care nurse helped, did the initial bedside assessment, established uh, connectivity with Mr. Jones, also contacted Mrs. Jones, obtained a copy of his advanced directive, and scheduled a consultation at a time that Mrs. Jones could be present. I was able to do a comprehensive symptom assessment via, during this telepalliative consult, also assess Mr. Jones' cognitive and functional status. I was able to listen to Mr. and Mrs. Jones and really get an understanding of their understanding of his condition, their expectations, their understanding of his long-term outcomes. We were able to review Mr. Jones' treatment preferences as well as his advanced directive, and we were able to come up with a symptom management plan. So the outcomes were that we came up with a symptom management plan. Mr. and Mrs. Jones agreed to the temporary feeding tube to resume his medications. But Mr. Jones made it very clear that he did not want long-term artificial nutrition or a feeding tube. And we were, I was able to complete a medical orders for life-sustaining treatment document to really reflect Mr. Jones' treatment preferences. So Mr. Jones stabilized, and he was able to get well enough to go to our subacute nursing facility to start therapy. His goal was to regain functionality and return home. Our palliative care nurse, who really acts as the nurse navigator, followed up with Mr. and Mrs. Jones while he was at the nursing facility. And again, we scheduled a follow-up so that I was able to follow up with them at the facility. My nurse was there and the, the nursing staff also participated in this consultation. So again, we were able to readdress how he was doing with his symptoms. We were able to review the recommendations of the, and the assessments of the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, as well as the speech therapist. Um, he had developed significant swallowing difficulty, so he was now on a modified diet. And he was tolerating it, but his oral intake really had plateaued at a new normal. He wasn't eating and drinking as much as he was before. And that was true with his functional status as well. You know, he had plateaued at a new normal. He was not able to ambulate anymore. He was wheelchair bound. And Mrs. Jones made the decision at the end of our consultation to take him home with a hospice bridge program because that had always been Mr. Jones' goal was to return home. But also important was that she clarified at this point that he really did not want to return to the hospital. Uh, spending more time in the hospital was really not his goal at this point in his life. And about a month after returning home, Mr. Jones developed aspiration pneumonia. It's very common in individuals with advanced Parkinson's disease. But he was able to stay home with hospice care and about 10 days later, he had a very comfortable, peaceful death at home. So Mrs. Jones called us a month later and actually thanked us for our help and support. She missed him dearly. You know, they'd been together for a lifetime. But she was certainly at peace and very thankful that she was able to, um, and he, that he was very comfortable at the end of his life, and that she was able to honor his wish to be home at the end of his life, and as well as his dignity. What technology did you use um, from one hospital to the other during his hospitalization to do the consult? Was it a cart that was wheeled into the room? So we have actually more than tele one telemedicine cart at the hospital, because the emergency department uses telemedicine carts. There is a tele behavioral health a program, and then one for pediatrics. But we have a telemedicine cart at the hospital that we use, and then we have a telemedicine cart at the, at the nursing facility as well. And how did Ms. Jones deal with that in the room, and would, was she seemingly comfortable? So I appreciate you bringing that up. 
I actually meant to mention it, so thank you very much. I, I forgot, so I appreciate you bringing up the question. So our experience has been, we have to, to date not been turned down. Like a referral has not been refused because of the tele part. The few refusals or uh, apprehensions we've had are just people's fears about palliative care. It's, it's not been because of the telemedicine aspect of it. And it may very well be because our nurse navigator really manages the telemedicine card. So the patient and the family really d do not have to deal with the technology side of it. That might be part of it. But when we started this journey, there was considerable concern and skepticism. You know, the average, I mean, the, many of the patients we see in Kent County are senior citizens and super senior citizens. So there was a concern that there may be a, an, acceptab an acceptance issue and actually that has not been our experience. Any further questions? Well, if I can just um, maybe sum up what I've heard here. Um, there's tremendous gaps across the continuum of age and um, everyone has talked about the value of telemedicine. It saves money, it saves time, people are happier, uh, it improves the quality of life. Um, this transcends age and disorder. People have been talking about the value of on the ground knowledge, knowing what happens in someone's home and in someone's school, um, instead of just you know seeing them um, for flashes in the clinic. Uh, there's shared barriers in terms of reimbursement uh, and, um, you know, even though, and, and policy, uh, there's incredible um, consistency in terms of the need for coordinated um, care, a coordinated team approach, um, a navigator, uh, a, um, a nurse manager, a concierge uh, service that makes it more inclusive. And I think what was really wonderful was the, the sense of uh, diff the, the the human understanding that was conveyed here of families and patients and um, different um, diverse, different kinds of diversity. Uh, I think that this group is not just using technology, it's not letting the technology use them. This group is using the technology and will continue to creatively do that. So I think it's this kind of discussion. And I have to say that not only the, um, I really had very little to do as a moderator. Uh, this group was put together by the, um, by um, Kathy um, Wiberly and, and, and a, a group of a committee and they, they came up with their own case studies and they coordinated everything themselves. And I knew because they were, you know, terrific, I could see they were really expert. I wasn't gonna interfere with them. But the fact that they were so superior, all of them, and coordinated was really remarkable. So I really, um, you know, appreciate that so much. You were all so wonderful. And, um, and as a group, you were too. Look, it's almost 5.30, you're still here. Um, and I've never had, a, even, even my classes sneak out before now, okay? So I like, um, I think my final job as moderator is to please ask you to fill out the, um, the um, assessment at the end. And isn't there some kind of drinking thing coming up next? <laughs> the chocolate martini. You have tickets. Now, I don't know if they're serving a chocolate martini, but on I've never had one like here. I mean, I, I don't usually drink a lot, but I do recommend them if you <laughs> for the evening. Thank you again. It was such an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you.